recommend meet up to a lot of my friends that are looking for different things. Wine tasting, movies, book club. Meet a lot of new people, a lot of new friends, and it will make you more social. Introducing WorldQuant, the partner of the Champions Chess Tour and Chess.com. WorldQuant is a global firm in the field of quantitative asset management. If you don't know what that is, it's the job of building complex mathematical models that seek to identify market inefficiency. For 2023, WorldQuant Brain is bringing together its International Quant Championship and the award-winning Champions Chess Tour to hunt down the next generation of quant finance specialists. It sounds very exciting. You put your skills in practice in a case competition where you get a real challenge. And I signed up. <laughs> WorldQuant is seeking new talent and new energy, and it's looking at the world of chess to help. Because nobody knows how to analyze a position better than a chess player, right? No quant experience? No problem. So, do you think you have what it takes to compete in the International Quant Championship? Sign up and be the next Quant Champion.
What is a chess dynasty? Unceasing dominance, move after move, again and again and again. We have a oh. resignation, we have history. He is the five-time FIDE World Chess Champion. But a chess dynasty can also be cruel. It forces most to defer their dreams until next time, if there is a next time. It's losing. Oh my God, did he just blow Yeah, him? he did. I'm blown away, the game is over. As the chess world turns to Kazakhstan, the Magnus Carlsen dynasty is set to close. The FIDE World Championship is finally up for grabs. For two chess superstars lying in wait, until next time is now. Jan Nepomnishi has methodically done what he needed to do to get another shot at the title. The pressure to seize the moment this time rests heavily upon him. Jan Nepomniši, first World Championship victory in Game 2. This has to be such an amazing feeling. Ding Li Ren knows firsthand what the end of this dynasty means. An unexpected chance to make history. Can China's best turn his good fortune into eternal fame? Whoa! What? Have you seen this move before? What's happening? He has to definitely find the momentum and recompose himself. The legacy of this championship spans across centuries. It reads from the names of chess giants. For the first time in a decade, a new name will raise the trophy and be etched into chess history. It's the 2023 FIDE World Championship, whose name will next be called champion. Before us, once again, is the majestic ballroom of the St. Regis Hotel in Astana, Kazakhstan, where exactly 12 minutes from now at 3 p.m. local time, world number two, Jan Nepomnishi, and world number three, Ding Liren, will commence the third match game of the 2023 FIDE World Championship. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Chess.com's coverage of the World Championship. I'm your host, Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky. Alongside me today, of course, Grandmaster Anish Giri, and someone's crashing the party. Master David Howell, a pleasure to have you in the studio. Yeah, thank you, Danya, and thank you, Anish. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for letting me gay crash. I've been watching the first two days from afar, and I'm hoping for more exciting chess today. Anytime, David. Anish, we had a rest day yesterday. I don't know about you. I really needed that rest day. I'm feeling energized. How are you feeling? Are you pumped for the third day of action? Yeah, I'm feeling ready and refreshed, and so do the players. I think today is an important day. Uh, what strategy will Jan choose with the white pieces? Will he be satisfied with his uh, one-point lead, or will he go for more? We'll see. We will see indeed. Let's have a look at the scoreboard and how the match has gone so far. The first game ended in a topsy-turvy draw. Jan had Ding on the ropes. Ding escaped, and then, of course, that shocking second game where Jan Nepomnishi scores his first victory in a world championship match. He defeats Ding Li Ren in resounding fashion with the black pieces, despite Ding Li Ren's opening trickery, that 4-H3 move. Unfortunately, it did not work. David, what a game that was. And what a challenge Ding now faces as he is staring down the barrel of, 
not only a one point deficit, but he also has to play black in this game. Yeah, we already knew that Ding wasn't uh, quite feeling himself, but uh, what a heartbreaking that defeat would have been on game two as well. The rest day must have come at an opportune moment. He would have uh, hopefully been able to switch off, been able to think about other things. And actually, it might be a blessing having Black in this next game. He can just react and uh, go with the flow. But uh, of course, if Jan is able to put some pressure on, things might get tricky. So we'll see. It's still early days in the match. I'm hoping that Ding is able to show his best form. Yeah, it's a good point there, David, actually, that uh, I didn't think about that. Of course, the, the, the problem with playing with the black pieces is that you cannot uh, force an advantage from the opening. You cannot try and come back on demand. But maybe you're right. Maybe that's not what you need. Maybe you need uh, to have a day without pressure just to steady that ship. So in that sense, uh, not, not the worst uh, color pairing there for Ding. But we'll see. Jan's looking, by the way, really fresh. Uh, so I can already see him arriving at the board. He most certainly is, and we hope Dingley Ren is going to look fresh because he has his work cut out for him. And speaking of Dingley Ren and his psychological mindset, obviously Ding will have to arrive with a positive mindset, with a strong mindset. And our very own FIDE master Mike Klein is doing some amazing work. Mike offers his insights on how Ding is going to handle the psychological challenges that await him in this game. Let's listen in. Going into round three, and what we all want to know is what style of play will Ding Liren choose? He played a little bit more solidly in game one, and although he was pressured, he held the draw. But in game two, he almost seemed to try to mimic his new bromance partner, Richard Rapport, by playing h3 on move four, a very offbeat move, and then castling on opposite sides. But he went down in flames, losing as white in only 30 moves. So will he go back to his traditional more solid style, or will he keep playing like the Romanian Grandmaster? We shall see. Now, we're Remember back to 2021, Jan Nepomneshi abandoned his more aggressive style. He tried to bore Magnus, those are his words, not mine. That didn't work out at all. So changing styles in 2021 didn't work. Changing styles in 2023, not working so far for Ding Loren. We will see if he goes back to his more solid style as black as he enters this third game. Also, Keep in mind that sometimes once you get one loss, a runaway train happens. Again, I'm speaking back to 2021, where Jan played just fine for about five rounds. But once he suffered his first loss, then came two, three, and then ultimately his fourth. So Ding definitely needs to stop the bleeding. We will see if he's able to do that. This is Mike Klein for Chess.com at the FIDE World Championship in Astana, Kazakhstan. Thanks, Mike. Ben. Fantastic insights as usual. And as we have a look at Ding and Nepo's head to head, obviously it's important for Ding not to catastrophize. You don't want to change your style too much because your record with Nepo is still pretty decent. Most games have still ended in a draw. And we have talked from the very, very start about how unbelievably evenly matched these players are, whether you look at their age, their classical rating, seven points separate that, or even their classical and rapid head to head. So David, I think that Ding could use that as a positive. The fact that, yeah, he lost a game, but in the grand scheme of things, they're still very evenly matched. Yeah, exactly. On paper, it's uh, basically a coin toss. And despite the fact his head-to-head -head is slightly inferior compared to Nepo, uh, he needs to take maybe inspiration from last year, where Magnus was the one uh, who were actually was down in the head-to-head -head against Nepomniachtchi and managed to turn it around. We all know what happened there. So... Yeah, he needs to not adapt too much, not change his style, not panic yet. It's still early days. And he is the slightly younger player, maybe slightly more energetic uh, in those closing stages. He just needs to stay in this match for now. Yeah, the head-to-head -head, uh, is one thing. I think the fact that he's trailing in the match, that's uh, another issue that Ding is facing, a big issue. And we don't want to see a one-sided match, as Mike Klein has suggested. We have seen some of those in history. The match, of course... The last match of uh, Magnus against Jan, but also there are other cases where things were rather one-sided. The Kramnik Anand match, surprisingly, was again also quite equal when it came to their individual matchup, head-to-head -head rating and all that. But uh, that match somehow spiraled out of control. A loss uh, by the, you know, with white pieces by Kramnik, one more loss with the white pieces by Kramnik, and it was all pretty much over. So um, that there is some danger there, but hopefully Ding will mount a comeback at some point. We will see, and obviously the pressure on these players is unimaginable. And it's unimaginable not only because the title of world champion is at stake, but also at stake is, of course, a massive prize pool. There are 2 million euros at stake, with 1.2 of them going to the champion and a pretty nice sum of 800,000 euros. I'll take it. 
if he does if the loser doesn't want it uh going to the runner up and of course the champion also defends uh their title at the next fide world championship they get to defend their title so the pressure on these players david i mean i was feeling nervous as a commentator before round one and before the show anish told me okay you're feeling nervous just put yourself in ding's shoes or nepo's shoes for just a second yeah, I get nervous playing friendly blitz games down the pub, uh, but uh, I can't imagine uh, the level of pressure that these uh, guys are under. It did show, I must say, in Ding's first couple of games, and it might have been vital that Jan has been here before. He was probably feeling the same uh, last year. So much at stake, of course, but uh, the players need to focus. They need to get that out of their minds uh, for now. And uh, here we do see Ding sitting at the board and the handshake incoming. Players ready yeah. to get the game going. Indeed, and the pressure, uh, that is something that no one is immune to. Even Magnus Carlsen in his first World Championship match against Lishian. And if you remember that first game with the Black Pieces, uh, where he played the Karokan after 1e4, he touched that C-pawn and the pawn just fell onto the board. His hands were trembling as uh, he dropped the C-pawn uh, on, uh, on the board. And not only that, he placed it on C6, which should have placed it on C5, of course, played the Sicilian instead. It was a very uh, nervous game for Magnus and um, obviously anybody who is facing this, such a challenge with so much at stake and is going, is going to, to feel the heat. And um, yeah, Ding has been suffering from that, but maybe now he's, you know, the worst is behind him. He already lost the game. Maybe he'll feel somewhat of relief and finally will be able to play his, his kind of game and, um, you know, get, get, get off to a, uh, to a good start of, of the round three. Well, it seems to me that the three minutes before the start of the game it might be the most nerve-wracking time for the players. Once the game starts, they kind of get into their groove. But we will put these three minutes to very good use, and we will remind you of the format for the World Championship. If you're just joining us, the scoring is very standard. There's one point assigned to the winner and uh, half a point for a draw. If you lose, you get zero points. In contrast to the previous World Championship, players swap colors each game, so no one has consecutive white or consecutive black, a draw cannot be offered by move 40, although a draw can be uh, agreed before move 40 through three-time repetition. First to seven and a half points wins the championship, also known as best of 14. And if the match is tied 7-7, there will be a rapid tiebreaker. But we'll cross that bridge if we get there. The time control for the classical portion is anything but rapid. It is one of the slowest and most methodical time controls that we have anywhere in any tournament or match two hours for the first 40 moves then an hour added after move 40 and then after move 60 another 15 minutes added to the player's clock and finally after move 60 a 30 second increment is established in order to avoid the craziest of time scrambles but we are very far away from move 60 we haven't had move one yet and this is that time these are the 60 seconds david i'm gonna ask you first are we gonna see 1e4 we're gonna see 1h3 i mean if Ding is playing H3 on move four, why not play it on move two <laughs> or move one? <laughs> I would love to see it, Daniel, one H3. Um, who knows? I think there's a ceremonial first move. Who knows what uh, the kind of guest will play on move one. But I do think we'll see Jan go for the Spanish, go for something he's uh, tried before. I don't think he's going to take too much risk in the opening. He just wants to achieve a playable position and put Ding under some pressure. So unfortunately, I don't think we'll see any surprises, any fireworks. How about you, Anish? Yeah, no, H3 there, I think, uh, the famous aus astronaut from Kazakhstan is going to execute the first move, and I'm, I think he will go for space, and that, that will be something in the center, 1e4, uh, the most likely. Jan says, do whatever you like, actually, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. So whatever you like, they keep... Uh, I see what you did there, I see. <laughs> yeah, keeping the ball back and forth there. Okay, okay. let's his see. Hands on his deep pawn. Holding on to the deep pawn. <laughs> so much doubt. Or is it? <laughs> <laughs> or, or is it the C pawn? <laughs> D4, that is. All right. Mm. That doesn't mean Jan will play D4. No, no, not at all. And I think Jan wants to keep these extra, extra few seconds in reserve, not to give it away to Ding. Keep him guessing. I guess one E4 is the more likely one, but we'll see. Okay. Oh. Anticipation mm. here. Moment of truth. What will he play? <laughs> and shake. Clock is starting. And now is the time. Game three, ladies and gentlemen, of the World Championship is upon us. Oh. And the first move has been made. And it is, in fact, D4. Oh, my lands. Wow. D4. Small surprise. David. 
What do you make of this? Yeah, I I mean, I'm a big fan, I've got to say, uh, despite the fact he started with 1e4 in the first game, despite the fact he got an advantage, it's always nice to kind of keep your opponent on their toes, keep them guessing. And yeah, I'll be fascinated to see Ding's response. I think we'll be able to tell a lot about Ding's mindset uh, by how he reacts to this first small surprise. Remember last World Championship match as well, Yan was mostly playing e4, no d4s at all. Uh, first surprise, first uh, kind of sign of mind game, Sinish. Yeah, no, surprise indeed. I mean, I if I thought about one C4, perhaps but one D4 is the move that Jan plays the least. He started playing it a lot recently. He played the Catalan. I think he suffered a lot on the black side of the Catalan in the World Championship match, and then later on in the candidates as well. He had to explore a lot of it, and so he adopted the Catalan with the white pieces. He also tried various other things in some rapid games. I remember some Nimso attempts uh, where he tried to go for uh, less explored uh, positions. I don't like Ding's body language. I don't like, I mean, okay, come on. We are surprised, we are commentators, but you should be ready, just just show more confidence, sit there a bit more firmly, make your move a bit faster. But knight of six uh, finally happened. Knight of six yeah. on the board. And of course, Jan controls the center with C4 and Ding responds with E6 so far, following the opening from the previous game. Now, Jan, uh, Anish, as you pointed out, has shown a predilection for the Catalan. He's played it a lot in the Rapid Chess Championship. In fact, he basically played exclusively the Catalan. So, I mean, David, I think you'll co-sign Anisha's point that there's no way that Ding, this didn't even enter his radar. Knight C3, by the way, is on the board. Yeah, um, D4, after all, is one of the two most popular first moves. So he would have uh, <laughs> spent some time, dedicated some time preparing this Ding. And yeah, I was kind of semi-expecting the Catalan as well once we saw D4, but it does make sense. Ding is a Catalan expert himself with the white pieces, so why not at least uh, ask a different question, maybe take him out of a comfort zone, and uh, there we go. It's a Queen's Gambit declined, and uh, no Nimzo Indian. A small surprise, but I like Ding's response here. Very solid stuff. He'll get a position out of the opening, very playable position, and no matter whether he's slightly worse, no matter whether he's slightly cramped, he's alive, and um, okay. Bishop G5. Who do you think surprised who more with this opening? Yeah, I think, David, uh, this is a very common um, common way to play nowadays because as the theory in the Nimzo Indian is expanding more and more, there's much um, many more forcing lines the black has to be aware of in the Nimzo. There is the Queen C2 Nimzo, there is the F3, there is the E3 Nimzo, there's the Knight F3, there's all sorts of different Nimzos. And the theory is expanding and the white's finding more and more forcing attempts. And at some point, Black uh, realized that they could get rid of all this, these headaches if they just learned the move 3d5 instead and go for this very solid crossbar structure. Now, the problem is the downside of that is that this particular version of the crossbar is not too favorable for Black as the c8 bishop will not be able to get out neither to f5 nor to g4 as white is going to go e3 followed by bishop d3 or queen c2. And then uh, with this bishop on uh, c8, it will be a problem piece for a while, and this version of Carlsbad is known to be somewhat passive for Black. But as Black tried to uh, get rid of all these Nimso headaches, they have gone deeper and deeper uh, into these uh, lines and uh, tried to devise ways to attempt to equalize. Now, things started with the move c6, not bishop e7, which suggests, suggests that he might go for bishop f5 after e3. This is another big system. Let's see now what moves he makes. Yeah, Ding, bishop f5. Moving just yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was going to say, sorry, Bishop F5 does lead to some forcing lines, but no. Okay, choosing something else. Very quick stuff, as you say, Danya, H6. Is this in H6 either of your... H6 on the board. Yeah, is this in either of your repertoires? I must admit, uh, I've only looked briefly uh, at these pawn structures in general, but uh, <laughs> yeah, not too sure on, on the specifics. If something, I'll have... Yeah, your... I... <laughs> 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 Please, yeah, I was going to defer to Anisha because I played this with White sparingly a couple times. Carl's bad structure has been around really since the early 20th century. I want to say, you know, the time of Akiba Rubenstein and, you know, all of those classical masters. So it's not a new structure. The structure is very well understood. But even within a very old structure, you could essentially have, you know, new wine in old bottles. You could have new ideas introduced to a line that has been known for over 100 years. So Anisha, I defer completely to you. All I really know is that white is a choice of where to develop the G1 knight. You could develop it to F3, or you could develop it to E2 after bishop D3 and essentially prepare the very ambitious F3, E4 pawn break. Is that a good summary of white's two overarching plans? 
Yeah, I would agree with you, certainly. So the, the two big plans that we know in the Carlsbad, uh, one more commonly used with the knight on f3, that's the minority attack on the queen side. That's where you go for rook b1, b4, b5, try to take on c6 and create a weakness on the c6 uh, square that, that weak pawn. The other common plan is indeed bishop d3, knight g2, and then you uh, more likely than not follow with eventual f3 and e4, going for the center, the Botvinnik plan. Then black in uh, their turn very often after f3 tries to generate some counterplay with either remove c5 or the move nowadays the more common uh, approach also is b5 a very uh, interesting and unusual way to play i should also mention in small detail the thing has already played h6 and it is uh, one of the two ways of playing nowadays with or without h6 but back in the day the traditional way of playing the carlsbad it was supposed to be when i was growing up as a kid, it was supposed to be that h6 is inaccurate because black was going for this knight bd7, knight f8, knight g6 plan. And then with the pawn h6, uh, white could go bishop d3, queen c2 and prevent that knight g6 jump. So this was some kind of old wisdom, but the modern engines, uh, they've discovered that it's not so simple. And besides this plan, black has many others and h6 could also certainly be a useful move. Now, uh, Jan is taking his time and it is already an impo important ju juncture, bishop d3 or queen c2 first. The differences are very, very subtle. Uh, you know, Black has different uh, ideas besides this knight to f8. There's also knight h5 idea. But Jan goes bishop d3, probably the more universal move. I suspect the bishop anyway has to land on d3, while the queen could stay on d1 in many of these variations. And I'm taking notes, Anish. Uh, this is an opportunity Thanks. for a free Thanks. opening masterclass. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Ding. Ding Castle. So here, I guess, is the juncture. Which plan does he go for? Which setup? And uh, Yan, do you think he'll have expected this at all? Uh, has Ding been playing this? Queen's Gambit declined uh, from time to time? He's played it against me, actually, in a rapid game. Uh, he used to play in the Nimtz so much more often, but I, I, I remember one time in one of these uh, Champion Store online rapids, I prepared some Nimtz against Ding. And I played uh, knight c3 on move 3, and Ding played d5 against me at the time. And then I remember he also played that against Ragnananda, uh, in that, that was a, a Champions Tour event that Ding actually won in the end. Uh, if you remember, he beat Prague in the final. And for me, the, all, all, so many Champions Tour events, I, I forget which one is which, but that was one that Ding won. Mm -hmm. And um, so he, he's been spotted uh, playing the system before. And so Jan has certainly prepared it. But it is even if you prepare, it's very confusing. All sorts of move orders. Castle, already, for example, Castle first is not a given, I, I believe. Knight bd7 first is uh, played uh, very often as well because there are plans where you go for knight h5, you trade the dark square bishops, then you go for knight b6, bishop out from c8, and you castle long if white also castles long. So mm -hmm. there are plans with long castle mm -hmm. for black as well. So castle is actually somewhat committal, uh, but uh, sometimes black knight uh, from b8 heads, uh, heads uh, to a6 after a5. I can go to a6, keeping the diagonal for the bishop open, and the knight eventually, anyway, via c7, gets back to the center, often to e6. So, uh, so many subtleties. And I think Jan is, uh, he has looked at this, but uh, these move orders are confusing him. And I think he's trying to remember what, what setup he is going, he's going for. Was it knight f3 here or knight e2 or queen c2 first? Uh, very confusing stuff, even if you look at it. And the main point is that even, even if uh, you have looked at something, prepared something, it is not so forcing. Both sides have uh, many, many options and uh, play is far from being forced. So I, I suspect we'll get a long strategic game and theoretical preparation will not play a big role here. Well, your point is very well taken, Anish. I think some people, when they look at Jan, as he took a couple of minutes before playing indeed, the move queen to c2, retaining maximum flexibility, hasn't decided where to develop his knight. A lot of people, they think either he expects it or he doesn't expect it, but there is kind of a middle ground a lot of openings, you know, Ding might have played a couple of times. So they were on his radar, but perhaps he didn't expect them uh, quite as much as he did some other openings. So he might remember some general ideas. He might remember, for example, where he chose to develop the knight from G1. But David, I think it's always so important to emphasize that these players are human. He might have forgotten, for example, wait, did I really decide to develop my knight to F3 before my queen of C2? Or was it after my queen of C2? There's so much that these players have to remember. It's totally natural for them to spend a couple of minutes to make sure that their head is screwed on right. Yeah, exactly. Despite the fact these players will have been uh, in preparation mode for months, uh, they can't check everything and they can't uh, 
always have checked everything recently. So even if Jan maybe hasn't looked at this exact position or this uh, variation in the last, uh, well, in the recent future, then for sure he'll have ideas in mind for later on. And like you say, it takes time to figure out the move orders. Um, he did spend a couple of minutes there, Jan. I think it's quite characteristic of him to at least pause, uh, but then make a quick snappy decision and ding. He also doesn't know whether Jan is in preparation or whether he's uh, kind of freestyling at this point. And uh, I noticed Jan was getting up there. Ding. He's been sitting at the board, working things out. And uh, I would be expecting him now after a minute or two to kind of echo Jan to play quickly. A bunch of ideas here, Anish, like you say, trying to develop the uh, black B8 knight. There were also some ideas of moving this knight out the way. I'm not sure if in this exact position, just to try and uh, get the dark square bishops off black could end up slightly cramped if he's not careful. So a trade of one set of minor pieces would make some sense here. Yeah, and there is also this new uh, trendy plan. So the usual way of trading the bishops is knight h5, uh, or if possible, knight e4. But here I think it's not possible. There are just too many captures there uh, in the end. But there is also this idea of uh, knight to e8. Here, I wonder if I'm not going to be able to take on e7 and on d5 in this particular oh. position. But I don't this, know. I actually think oh. I know this line, Anish. C takes d5. I think there's a rook sack where black goes cd, queen c8, and knight c6. Yeah, it doesn't work. Confusing. Right? Interesting. Yeah, yeah just to put this on work. the board, queen takes queen b4, eight, maybe? and I get trapped. Queen b4 first, maybe queen b4 first. Queen b4 yeah, first. Mm -hmm. Queen b4 here. Check. And this looks scary, right? Yeah, very, very messy stuff. But Ding has already played the more traditional uh, approach, rook e8. And he's keeping that knight on b8 for now. I think, uh, indeed, he might be going towards a6. I've seen a lot of re recent games where they go a5, knight, a6. And I think that that might well be the plan for Ding. Now, after rook e8, I think Jan will most likely go for knight e2 because knight f3 can be met with knight e4, which often solves uh, many mm -hmm. of black's problems. Yeah, you trade off uh, at least a set of minor pieces, maybe even two, uh, with this very strong uh, knight on e4 now. Yeah, I like it uh, from Ding, not releasing the tension too soon. Rook e8, very flexible. And this, I guess, is the moment that you were uh, both mentioning. The moment of truth, does white kind of put the knight on e2? Uh, does white get tempted to castle queenside in some variations? Uh, I'm kind of hoping for something along these lines in the near future. <laughs> just uh, so. kind of he's had a, he's had a good experience with opposite side castling Jan already wants this uh, wants this match but okay knight e2 and yeah more typical plans here white is going to castle kingside most likely mm -hmm. yeah. yeah this is the old Batvinik plan I've seen some games from the 30s and 40s you know Batvinik Karras uh, where before black's counterplay ideas were well known White, which is castle, play f3, play e4, e5, f4, f5, and just one zero. And those were the golden, you know, the golden age when, you know, you could study a line better than your opponent and you could just crush the best players in the world with a typical plan game after game. Anish, unfortunately, I think those days are over. But the plan of f3, as far as I know, remains extremely legitimate and uh, very, very dangerous. Uh, certainly, f3 is uh, a way to play. It's no longer the only way to play because black has devised different um, solutions for this f3, e4, e5, uh, uh, you know, uh, idea of uh, rolling across the board. Uh, as I mentioned, after f3, always c5 comes into consideration. It's a typical idea in this pawn structure that c5 uh, right now would just create a isolated, weak, isolated d5 pawn. But after f3, c5, if you then capture, then the e3 pawn is also very weak and very soft. So it's a sort of a well-known wisdom that you go c6 and after f3 you go c5 in many of these positions. And as I mentioned earlier, another very common idea is this b5, b4, kicking the knight away from the center. And then after um, e4 happens, at some point black takes d takes e4 and uh, starts targeting the central pawns. For example, after f e4, sometimes you can play a move like bishop g4, hitting the knight on e2, then d4 pawn is already kind of under attack. So it is, or after d4, f e4, there is knight g4 jump very often where you are uh, trading a pair of bishops and knight is heading to e3. So uh, lots of counterplay ideas have been in, indeed uh, devised by now. You no longer can just play f3, e4 and roll over. And, 
And so there, there are many different uh, plans here. Ding is taking his time. I, this position is a huge, huge tabia. You cannot be surprised here so far. Jan has played all the main uh, moves, so all, all the standard moves. And uh, Ding is choosing or trying to remember what, what move order he's, uh, he's looked at, whether it's knight bd7 or a5. Very often they are um, really similar. And that is also why he's probably thinking. Perhaps he has both options available to him. Um, but um, yeah, I, as I mentioned, play is not forced, so it is only logical that the players already started taking their time, because even if you know that your next move is a5, anyway, likely you might be out of book three moves later, and you might as well start thinking now. Mm -hmm. And there we go, knight bd7 instead. I was about to say I'm slightly concerned that Ding is thinking, considering it was him who chose this line, him who kind of uh, picked the whole variation, but yeah, very normal move. Uh, I guess that knight is flexible right now. Um, is it going to park itself on f8 here, Anish? Uh, or is it going to stay on d7 just in case black does start pushing those queenside pawns? Um, oh, as I mentioned, because of this pawn... Uh, yeah, I, I assume Jan is castling short. I think long castle in this particular position is not what people uh, people usually do. So I think uh, castle short is, is going to happen. And then um, knight f8... To g6 is no longer possible because of the pawn on h6. So I think what black usually does in these uh, positions is go for knight h5. That's also what Ding did against me. I think against me, Ding played a move a5 first, um, and then he played knight h5 for move later. The differences are very subtle. Usually it's a transposition of sorts. Uh, so you, you get this knight h5, bishop should be queen in position. And I think we will get that one um, today as well. And I had a game with Ding. He... Played very uh, that game he played very quickly it was a rapid game he played very quickly and um, very convincingly and I got nothing I was not expecting the system I didn't prepare anything specific and uh, that game ended in a draw and uh, I remember feeling that you know I let Ding off the hook there I prepared some uh, sharp nim so I had some idea in mind but he just went for uh, for this and uh, escaped very easily now Jan I believe uh, will pose more problems because of course in this position White has on different uh, different ideas you can still go for the minority attack or you can uh, try to go for f3 e4 setup uh, still lots of play left here um, but let's see let's see the what happens if knight h5 indeed will follow or if Ding once again goes for this a5 move which is flexible anish what do you make of knight e4 in this position because i face that kind of move a lot in, in online blitz does that work tactically is it an alternative I guess that you had a lot of games here against Nihal Sarin because I had a lot of games against Nihal Sarin uh, yes. in this <laughs> in these cross spots for some reason. He's playing them extremely well. I've been getting attacked a lot by him. So what happens very often actually in this cross spot, although Black seems to have a passive position, they shift the focus to the uh, king side, and Black often manages actually to uh, set up an attack on the king side more often than not. There was a once a beautiful game between Peter Leko and Vladimir Kramnik in the the Legends. Uh, There's Legends of Chess here. I have, um, I have a mug here, Legends of Chess, uh, Champion Store Tournament. And um, so it could happen that white goes for the before b5 plan and uh, black starts um, uh, counter plan the king side. Knight e4. So what I would like to say about knight e4 is it's a thematic move. And what happens very often is then, okay, we take on e7, queen e7, and now bishop e4, d4. Now, if our knight has been on um, f3, we would have to lose time with knight d2. Um, and that... And here, we don't have to waste that move. The knight already is well placed on e2. It can uh, go to f4 or g3. So I believe in this particular version, when the knight is on e2, knight e4 is considered to be inaccurate, and you see the bar is slightly in white's favor. That said, of course, uh, I, if we're going to play a blitz game now, me against you, I'm sure I'll get mated a couple of times with white, because you'll go knight f5, knight f6, h5, h4, or whatnot. Um, but uh, objectively, if white plays uh, accurately here, one of the ideas is... Um, some point to go like knight to a4 and then queen to c5 once the knight comes to f6 so you try to trade queens or sometimes you go for d5 actually d5 is a very common idea also trying to immediately create counterplay in the center the queen side distracting black from the potential uh plans on the king side so if white accurate usually in this particular version the white should get an advantage objectively so I think knight e4 with the knight on e2 in this particular position is not how a black treats uh, usually it's it's with knight on f3 so I, yeah, uh, I think the choice is mainly between knight h5 and a5 first. He played a5 like against me. I didn't really understand why he did it against me, but he did it again now. So he insists on this. Uh, I'm quite uh, pleased that he used 
you know what he what he thought was worthy of playing against me in rapid he finds worthy of playing uh in the world championship match game i feel i feel honored you know that that he wasted his <laughs> world championship prep, match prep against me in that rapid game <laughs> a5 is indeed on the board and you know what else is on the board dingley ren is not on the board uh at least not yet but he is at the board and i want to bring your guys attention to the fact that i might be jumping the gun here this might be unimportant but thus far i think yana pamnishi has gotten up quite a bit more than dingley ren um as ding he continues to sit at the board you know 15 20 seconds after the move has been played david that has been very very unusual ding has made a beeline literally every move right for the rest area. Do you make anything in the early going of uh, Ding's habits at the board? Is this a conscious choice to uh, to sit more at the board or do you think this is unimportant? Yeah, I'm going to reserve uh, judgment on that just for a few more moves, but I like the fact that he's been sitting at the board. Um, you mentioned it, Danya, there's been a lot of, uh, of posts on social media about it. Maybe he's aware of that. Uh, maybe his second, Richard Rapport, has had a word with him saying, okay, you need that extra time. You need to be able to focus, get in the zone. Uh, maybe he's just been scarred by that previous defeat. And uh, that was one of the main takeaways from it. But uh, either way, it's nice to see him there sitting at the board. Jan, maybe putting the pressure on saying, okay, you have to sit there because I'm going to move uh, super fast. And he plays A3 very quickly and ding back on the move. I think actually long-term in this match, it's going to help him. Uh, ding, if he kind of gets in this rhythm of uh, only going away when he really needs to. We saw what happened last year, of course. What were your conclusions, uh, Anish, Danya, about uh, the kind of both of the players' habits, uh, playing habits and body language in the first two games? Yeah, it's a generally a fascinating uh, question, you know, how much to get up from the board. Now, you are not supposed to, in the normal tournament setting, get up from the board when it's your move. This rest a resting area is a luxury that uh, players have only in top tournaments. And uh, having a resting area with a screen where you can see your board is very rare, even in top tournaments. And so you normally cannot afford this and uh, you're supposed to sit behind the board, but whether you get up from the board during your opponent's move or not, that's the choice. And many players have different habits. Peter Swidler is known to walk very fast, pacing around the entire playing hall. Um, I also like to walk around quite a bit, but you have players, in particular Veselin Topalov, who makes this a case in just sitting at the board the entire time. And I believe that uh, it's a decision he and his uh, coach manager uh, made. They decided at some point to follow Bobby Fischer's path to the top. And Bobby Fischer was always sitting at the board as well. And uh, this approach is very, very interesting, especially if combined with an incredible, um, incredible stamina, which is what Veselin always had. I, I know he is extremely fit. He's been swimming uh, kilometers uh, as for, for his preparation. And with that approach, so if you've got the stamina and you sit the, for five, six hours straight behind the board, you can think the entire time, not burn yourself out because you're super fit and gain that extra time. While for normal people who are less fit than Veselin, uh, if they are to do that, they will at some point simply blunder stuff. And even Veselin, who is very fit, this is one of the reasons why he sometimes blundered because uh, the concentration is just too high for too long of a period of time. And at some point, the brain is collapsing and uh, blundering something. But I also want to mention is that Jan played A3 very quickly. I think he um, is aware of my game against uh, Ding, because A5 didn't come as a surprise. Now he recollected his preparation. I remember that A5 is met by A3. And now it's uh, to, up to Ding to show if he has an, a different move than Knight H5, which is what people usually do here. We've yes. Go ahead, David. Sorry, go on, Danya. No, I just was going to mention that we've emphasized the F3, E4 idea, but of course there's also the stock minority attack on the queen side, B4, B5, uh, that is being actively prepared with A3. Yeah, uh, definitely. And also maybe a, just a bit of a waiting game. He's asking uh, Black which plan he's going to go for. Um, Anish mentioned that F3 is often met by B5, B4. So um, he's kind of saying, okay, you can commit to B5, but now I wouldn't have weakened my center as white, and uh, you might regret that plan. The black C6 pawn will uh, simply be a target. Yeah, interesting from Jan. I like it. Uh, this last move for white, very flexible. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure which one he's going to go for. I think he'll wait to see um, yeah, how Ding reacts, first of all. I was going to say, Anish, it's really fascinating, the kind of, kind of stamina sitting at the board uh, question. I know that uh, the English... 
number one, uh, long-term number one, Michael Adams said he made a conscious decision when he was in his mid twenties to stop walking around. And that's how he has this longevity. He's in his fifties now, still, still a phenomenal player. He just never gets up and I can't do that. I get restless. I need to kind of, I have this curiosity to look at other games. Um, but these players, they don't have that. It's just purely their own game, whether they're in their rest room, whether they're kind of, uh, sitting at the board, they're still thinking about the moves. So. Yeah, it's just interesting whether they see better on a kind of computer screen or on the physical pieces themselves. What do you think? Yeah, I I think the question is interesting, but I think Ding has answered that question for himself. Uh, the previous game where he spent a lot of time thinking uh, in front of the screen, he, as he confessed, he missed a lot of things. He missed, for example, GTX F6 after thinking for um, half an hour almost behind the, the screen. And so he concluded that this whole behind the screen thinking is maybe not for him, not right now. And uh, I like it. I think Ding, uh, you know, he's scarier when he's at the board. Uh, he's sitting there. You see him concentrating. Like, like for example, now I look at the Ding. Uh, the Ding, sorry, I look at Ding. I look at his hands. I look at his head. I feel, you know, the I feel the, the energy, the thought, the thought thinking process. And as Jan, uh, aware of Ding sitting there, I mean, this this is a thinker. This is a chess player. This is the one that you fear. Uh, the one that is beating Carlson. Uh, the one that has won many tournaments, the one that has been uh, 2,800, that is Ding Liren there sitting thinking. And that is how I, I like to see him and how is the most feared, not in a restroom, resting area with a, with a hoodie on, uh, you know, looking uh, uh, looking cold and, and uh, miserable. This, this is the Ding that we, that we know. Mm -hmm. What's your lifetime score like against Ding? And he's just out of curiosity, you mentioned you've had pretty much this exact position against him. Uh... I was quite fortunate uh, in many of my games against Ding, and I think my score against him is actually pretty good. Um, but the couple of losses that I had against him were extremely impressive. So I think I was able to play pretty good chess against him, uh, even in uh, the, the games that I lost. But um, there are some games where he played from start to finish an absolute masterpiece. So there was a game in Sinkfield Cup where he won the tournament, where he beat Carlson in the tiebreak. At that time, I made one strategic inaccuracy or a mistake in the opening that was not at all obvious to me, but he had outplayed me masterfully demonstrating why that, that one move was a mistake. And uh, of course, I made more mistakes, but none of them were obvious. And it was an absolute masterpiece. I really learned a lot from that game. And many people uh, praised his, his play there. I think it was brilliant. Also, I've had uh, a couple of rapid losses against him. Uh, where he played the Catalan in a very masterful fashion, nurturing a small edge without making a single mistake. And I only had to err once or twice. And uh, th there was there was one instance also when we played at an uh, Olympiad and um, I only uh, was managed to, managed to escape because his team has already beaten mine. So by making a draw, he essentially um, won the match. So if, if not, if the score in the match would have been equal, he would have probably managed to beat me in that game as well. But I, I was lucky against him in multiple other games, so I have a decent score. But I, I do have tremendous respect for him, and I think when Ding brings his A game to the table, he is uh, one of the best players in the world, and in certain positions, uh, especially with the white pieces, I think he is a very good uh, player with the white pieces. He has outplayed Magnus Carlsen even in some rapid games. In certain positions that he understands, he performs at an incredibly high level. As he himself mentioned in an interview, He's, uh, you know, he's a big, um, big fan of uh, computers in chess, AI in chess, and he he wants to play like AI. And I think in some in some cases he achieves that that kind of level when the positions that he understands. And I I do hope for him that today's position he also understands. He's playing with the black pieces, but uh, I guess he is uh, into finesses. He, he does go knight h5. I I, uh, I didn't see what alternative, um, what sensible alternative he had at this point. Knight h5 is the standard move. It is indeed. Knight h5 is on the board after a significant think, and we will see by force a trade of dark squared bishops. So the position kind of quieting down here, very strategic. I'm sure that there are still uh, games in the database. And I was just going to add, as a commentator, I've tried to pay a lot less attention. I said this in the last broadcast to the body language of the players, because uh, I've learned that the body language is incredibly unpredictable. The same facial expression, the same reaction with three different players means three different things. But I think just objectively, the Dingley Ren that we see here right now is a more confident Dingley Ren. I don't think that you can argue with that. David, it just, you just, 
get a bit of a different feel. Obviously, we're still very early in the game. We're still in the opening phase. But I think a pretty auspicious sign that Ding isn't running toward the break room. You know, he's moving methodically and he's fully focused on the board. Yeah, we talk about surprises in the opening, surprises on the board, but it's also nice to surprise your opponent uh, with body language, I guess. And it's just a statement to Jan, uh, if nothing else, just that he's serious now, that he's focused, that he's in the zone. And um, yeah, of course, a uh, quick reply there. Both moves forced, as you mentioned there, Danya, but I'm expecting Ding to sit at the board and he does continue to do so. I think if he was going to go with his strategy of kind of darting off, uh, going, walking around, chilling, then uh, this would have been a good moment to get up. Uh, Jan has a bunch of interesting moves, a bunch of plans to choose from. And uh, I'm expecting him to spend a bit of time. So yeah, I think this was the moment that we can confirm. Ding has learned from uh, the experiences of day, of day one, of uh, the first two games, and he's going to be sitting there. Um, time trouble did play an issue, uh, did play a part, right? In uh, game two, in his defeat there, almost was decisive in game one too. So if you can save an extra couple of minutes on the clock by sitting at the board, that makes a lot of sense. Um, now white to play. Jan, do we think he's going to go for this minority attack that we've been uh, alluding to a bit? Uh, it feels harder now at least to push any pawns in the center. Well, yeah, I, I'm a little surprised how long uh, Jan is taking because I I was fooled into thinking that he is uh, in his in his preparation when he played a3 this quickly because a3 is not a, a must. And this particular position, yeah, I think he's trying to memorize, uh, you know, what, what, what was his setup. It's a very subtle position. I remember when, when I looked at this kind of position with engine, it gives all sorts of different moves with around the same evaluation. And what the engine really likes to do is it, it sometimes plays a move like rook a to b1. And then if black reacts to it in a certain way, it goes then the rook from b1 to e1. Or it also says you can also go first to e1 if black reacts in a certain way, you can then go back to b1. And so like these positions, they're extremely subtle because the idea of b4 is also somewhat committal after b4, a, b, a, b, b5 is sometimes an idea where the knight heads over by b6 to c4. Uh, also b4, uh, b4, yeah, I mean, the, the 96, 94 is an idea um, when it's a big question uh, who benefited from uh, weakening the C4 and C5 squares. Another thing is that even if white gets B5, even if white gets BC, 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 there are some classical games where white was able to exploit this one weakness because then later in some rook and game, they played G4 exclamation mark and also um, created a weakness on H6. But in re in the rook and game, of course, yeah, not, not in the middle game. But in the reality, in the modern day reality, these uh, minority attack ideas, uh, they're, they're not uh, going to win you many games, especially classical games. Black only has one weakness. And uh, if everything gets traded, black will play h5. Now this is well known. You don't go allow g4 in the rook end game. And with only one weakness on c6, it is not uh, the end of the world for black. So minority attack is, uh, is a viable plan, but it's not really crushing. Uh, at the same time, the plan of f3, e4 is also very hard to execute. Uh, there is this idea of going uh, rook a1 and then the knight away somewhere and f3 but then after f3 uh, as i mentioned black can play uh, black can play c5 black can also play queen g5 now when after queen g5 both the rook and the queen are targeting the e3 pawn and it's very hard to uh, push e4 sometimes uh, some players have played moves like knight d1 but once you go knight d1 and then f3 uh, i mean with the knight so passive on d1 are you really are you really happy to open the center this way? I'm not sure. So uh, the position is extremely solid for black, extremely robust. And uh, Jan seems to yeah, not, 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 be, uh, not remember uh, exactly what he prepared. And I have to say, I don't know how relevant this is because Jan is a very gifted player, a very talented one. Uh, but I don't think he has any experience in the Carlsbad uh, with neither color. I think he lost that game against Carlsen with the black pieces. Uh, he got outplayed very, very badly. It was one of the best games by Magnus. Uh, it was just two days before he he withdrew from the Singfield Cup, but the masterpiece in round one. Uh, but Jan, in in turn, unlike Magnus, who Magnus is like a big, big uh, fan of Carlsbad. He's played so many Carlsbad structures from all kinds of openings. You can also get it uh, with both colors. You can get it from London system, from the Karo Khan. Uh, many, many systems where you get the Carlsbad. But Jan, I think, is not very familiar with the Carlsbad structures. So if he doesn't have his uh, 
uh, path worked out here. I am not sure uh, that he by default will play it very well. And also, I think his body language, I noticed he was not thrilled. I think he had some nice plan in the Nimso he was looking forward to, but now he is not thrilled. Yeah, and he has just played Rook A to E1, so kind of signaling. And Anish, you mentioned the Rook can come to E1. That doesn't necessarily mean that he uh, is committing to F3, E4. Maybe he's uh, doing a little bit of misdirection. But for the time being, we can conclude that he is uh, settling himself in toward preparing the central plan. Knight E2 can drop back to C1, then F3 and E4. And of course, for the time being, Black can't really play C5 because the D5 pawn is hanging. But the knight from H5 can always return to F6. And the other drawback of the move C5, when you combine it with A5, as Ding has done, then the B5 square opens up potentially for uh, White's knight. So C5 could be a very, very committal move. David, Black cannot procrastinate because it seems like he's got a lot of time. But if you think about it, you know, knight C1, F3, E4, that's only three moves. And you don't just want to put, you know, put this off like I've put off my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only one there, Daniel. Don't worry. Um, but hey, yeah, this is the type of position. The taxes. Oh no. <laughs> this is the type of position where I would uh, be tanking. I would spend 20 minutes trying to figure out how to be productive as black, where to put the black knights, what to do, how to react to what, um, how white wants to step forward in the center. And that's uh, that's the question I'm hoping Ding already has an answer to. Again, he chose the variation. Um, he chose this setup. He's got experience here against the niche. Uh, no less than a niche, so um, I'm sure he's uh, he's got a setup in mind. Daniel, you mentioned uh, kind of not procrastinating. What does that involve? Maybe uh, improving the Black Knights. I'm not sure which direction. Uh, this one at some point needs to decide whether it wants to step back. Um, you've kind of got three moves. That plan we mentioned for White moving out the way F3 E4. Um, so Black does have a bit of time. Yeah, it feels, uh, feels like there must be decent ideas at his disposal. Anish, I think you can probably provide you have more experience in this position, but it seems to me that there's a cat and mouse situation with the knight on h5. If it drops back to f6 too early, then um, black might allow white's knight to access sort of prime real estate on g3, which is, it seems to me, a perfect square from which it can prepare f3 and e4. So maybe it's in black's best interest to remain on h5 until white has played knight c1 and then jump back to f6. And David, yeah, I second your point about the other knight. B6 does seem like the most natural square. Knight D7 to F6 looks really, really awkward. Then the H5 knight runs out of square. So, uh, Anish, would you second this kind of setup, Knight B6, and then delaying Knight F6 until White's committed uh, the Knight to C1? Uh, I think you brought a very good point. I, th I think Knight H5 to F6 is not a move you uh, play quickly. It's not a move you need very often either, because even after F3, E4, if the Knight moves away from E2, your Knight from H5 gets access to F4. So I don't think you want to retract the knight from h5 too quickly. Um, I wanted to just add also one point to what you said. When you said knight d to f6 looks bad, it looks odd, but it's not as um, awkward as it seems because very often after knight d f6, you then go g6 followed by knight g7, supporting bishop f5, and then suddenly the knights do make sense. So knight d f6 is not out of the question uh, in these kind of structures. But indeed, black usually chooses between knight b6, knight f6, and knight f8. And also queen g5 first. I think queen g5 is a very common idea in these kind of positions. And uh, Ding uh, is taking his time. I mean, I'm pretty sure, I think rook a1, I think that must have been my game against him as well. Uh, I think that's literally, we're still following my game against him. Uh, we have to check that. But I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, indeed, this is my game. Uh, but... I guess Ding is uh, trying to to think maybe Jan has an improvement somewhere. Also, I'm sure he doesn't recall all the details either. There are also many different options of around same value. So he's trying to get into the game, trying to, to go deep into his thoughts. And I'm curious if Jan actually has something uh, real prepared or if he just uh, saw a couple of games, uh, has has a very superficial knowledge of this position and just uh, follows my game. Sometimes also he, you might mix up. Sometimes you have seen a game and you have prepared something, and you mix these two up together. So you think that you prepared the Ethereum K1, but actually it's just my game. He just did his so. It's not his. It's not, it's not his prep. He just remembers the the Ethereum K1, and then later on the second but yeah, that was a, a game of Anish. Anish played like an idiot. He should have played completely different. You know. So maybe that that's happening. I don't know. 
Yeah, that's how I learn openings. Uh, pretty much, I just look <laughs> at other people's games and try and copy. I never know whether it's good, bad, but uh, <laughs> I'm very influenced by the result in the database as well. Uh, there was a famous, so, uh, uh, very famous case, uh, actually, in the match between Vichy and Magnus, the second match where Vichy, was, uh, Vichy came a little closer and he uh, managed to beat Magnus in game, game three. And what happened is that Magnus followed, he followed the game of Michael Adams, his second, all the way until he got a lost position. And that is because I believe Magnus had that confused. And very often you see that people, uh, they remember, they study games and what you should do or what you should do and what you should not do. And they remember what they should not do, but they don't remember that they should not do that. <laughs> that happens a lot. And the biggest <laughs> example is World Championship match. So it can happen, yeah. But of course, uh, yeah, okay, one, it cannot be so bad, but uh, whether that's uh, Jan's uh, prep or not, we'll see. And Ding is taking his time. He, he can afford to. He has uh, plenty of time now. The position is not too forced, but I do expect him to make a move at some point soon because, and he does now, yeah. And it is, it is knight d7 to f8, deciding on the placement of his knight, opening up the diagonal for his light squared bishop. Of course, this discussion of being influenced by the previous grandmasters who've played a line, that reminds me of, <laughs> I'm channeling my inner Yasser here, that famous story involving a young Vichy Anand. Uh, yes, and, and Robert Hubner, in that, and adjusted his glasses and said in his accent, um, or was it uh, in Austria? I don't remember where the tournament was. But anyways, Vichy Anand uh, decided to play a Petrov in a game against Colombian GM Alonso Zapata. Um, and now I'm saying all of this in Yasser's voice. This was the 80s. Now, in order to prepare, he had looked at the chess informant, which was what you used back in the day in order to prepare openings. And he had seen a game uh, of GM Larry Christensen in uh, an interesting and rare Petrov line. That game had ended in a draw. He thought, that's an interesting line. I haven't seen it before. So he decides to repeat it against Alonso Zapata. It turns out that that is a blunder. It blunders a piece on move four. This is Vishianon's shortest loss of his career. And it turns out the game Larry Christensen had drawn in that line was a prearranged draw. So the players had just randomly selected a move, not realizing that it was actually a blunder. And that is how Vichy lost that game. So you always have to take other people's games and moves with a bit of a grain of salt. I, we could perhaps show that line, David. Yeah, you're doing that right now. Of course, knight f6, uh, knight e5, d6. This is the main line Petrov, knight f3, knight e4, standard fair, knight c3. And in this position, Christensen had debuted bishop f5. Bishy said, hey, it's a pretty interesting move. Why does it lose? Because after queen e2, he resigned the game. Queen e7 is forced. And now knight d5 sends the queen back where it came from. And then d3 picks up the black knight. So always check lines independently of who played them. And the great Vichy Anand, <laughs> you know, he's achieved so many, uh, so, so much in his career as a five-time world champion, legend, one of the best players of all time, greatest players of all time. And uh, he has to be constantly reminded by all sorts of commentators of that one game he once blundered. And I see this game being remembered on all sorts of occasions much too often and like now also out of where did this game come from wish will be watching our broadcast later he'll be seeing he'll be like why guys why what have i done just as a carlsbad on the board why why my game against the Zapasa? <laughs> can we please get over it it's been 30 40 years it's time to time to 40 years 40 right years. around yeah. yeah 35 wow yeah. I'll uh, I'll save Vichy's blushes as well by offering up my own painful example where it's definitely better to know nothing than uh, nothing at all than something. And that was against you, Anish, when I uh, in oh, our yes. game. I think it was two thousand nine or ten in Vikanze in the B group, and I followed some line, and it was exactly what was in my notes what not to do for black. And I, I remember we blitzed to like move twenty, and then I sat there realizing I was completely lost <laughs> and wanted to resign. So yeah, it's definitely sometimes better to. Everyone happened to all of us uh, i think it, it's just how memory works i guess the memory you you remember lines but uh, you don't remember what's attached to them you don't remember the evaluation of course you if you refreshed it recently you do but if you looked at it too long ago or uh, you didn't look at it with full concentration then you might mix mix up i've heard the same i've heard it from luke van Veli also when he played his vikanze tournaments and he was losing in all the neither of g5 neither of the sharp neither of sicilians the, his coach was constantly complaining and he said that you know i realized i should never show luke what not to do because every time i show him what not to do he does exactly that <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Ooh. That's why I started playing Old Man Chess, where you can't lose straight out of the opening, even if you forget everything. But uh, meanwhile, Knight C1 on the board, as expected. Indeed. Yeah, you know... Preparing F3. I have once uh, played this Knight C1, uh, I don't know, Knight C1, F3, Queen F2 plan. Um, and then people started repeating it because I won a nice game against Fresnet. But I, uh, I'm really not sure this is such a great, great plan. And um, I, I think the modern computers are not big fans of it anymore. And I wonder uh, how how deeply Jan has looked at this. Uh, but uh, whether whether he had actually looked at it in great detail, or whether it was something very superficial, where he just knew this plan and and the sort of yeah, and uh, he's just following it. Because I believe that Black has multiple ways. Even in this, even in uh, my game against Ding, Ding, what he played was he just met F3 with C5. And uh, we, we got a position where he has an isolated pawn, but I had this weakness on e3, and I didn't get anywhere. Maybe I, my play can be improved, but in that rapid game, I got absolutely nowhere. So we'll see. We'll see what Ding will do. But in general, I, I like the game for Ding. By the way, so far I like uh, that he's sitting behind the board. I like the position. I like that Jan is not so familiar with it. Um, I like that it's solid, and uh, there is room for um, creativity. There is room for minor inaccuracy for Black. You don't have to be super precise. I think uh, so far, I personally feel it's a good outcome from the opening, and I am optimistic for Ding and his fans. Uh, I like just that he sits there at the board, and I like his composure, and I think we might see him back in the match at some point. Maybe if not today, then uh, in the upcoming days. Mm -hmm. It would be a success for him, right, just to get on the scoreboard, just to get out of this black game uh, with some good emotions, just uh, knowing he didn't face too many troubles. Um, but what moves are we expecting? You mentioned that he wants to be ready to meet uh, F3 by breaking with C5. So I'm expecting something that defends the D5 pawn. Maybe mm -hmm. developing this bishop. Um, does he want to continue maneuvering, maneuvering his knights now that uh, this knight has gone uh, away from G3, from F4? Maybe black can drop back with this piece. Yeah, knight F6 is an option now, certainly. Now that the knight has left E2, knight F6 certainly becomes an option, especially now that F3 can be met with C5. Uh, but again, he can also go for this... Queen g5 idea, I believe. I think that that's what people do, this queen g5 move. Uh, it's yes. quite annoying. <laughs> Definitely in a blitz game, queen g5, bishop h3, I would start, you know, salivating at the prospect of some tactics, except, you know, I'd play someone like Anisha would just send my queen away. Obviously, we should point out that f4, uh, I think, is a tempting move for players less initiated in typical plans. But now, how are you going to play e4? The queen more than happy to return even back to d8. So with white, pawns can't go backwards. That is the operating principle in this position. Yes, yeah, Daniel Ranch has taught us that pawns can move backwards. Uh, but I have to say that one little detail I noticed that after queen g5, actually bishop h3 might not be a threat at all. Because if, let's say, I make a waiting move, like let's play knight b3, after bishop h3, I suspect you might be losing a piece to f4. Mm -hmm. Queen g4 and king h1. Ooh. So bishop h3 is maybe not uh, directly a threat. But mm -hmm. you don't have to follow it up with bishop h3. You could just play queen g5 with the idea to prevent f3 for now. Maybe sometimes this, there's this move g6, uh, you know, to, to go for bishop, knight g7, bishop f5 plan sometimes. Uh, I'm, I'm, or or you, can, you can move the knight back now to f6, perhaps, with the queen on g5. And you got sort of the queen outside the, um, yeah, you got the queen out, let's say. It's now active. And next, maybe you want to go h5, uh, h5, h4 kind of things. It's it's very subtle, these positions, very hard to say, but maybe you could try to hint at some uh, attacking potential on the king side. So lots of options, certainly. I think this moment is a very critical moment after knight c1. I think Dink uh, must be aware of uh, of this, but maybe he thought it was not so critical, and so he is wondering now. What Jan has prepared, he is trying to think uh, if there is a trap awaiting him um, at the end somewhere, and uh, trying trying to choose between the different options. Indeed, a very rich position, diverse in plans for both sides. White seems to be banking on the classical idea f3, e4. Ding is searching for the best setup to take the sting out of that plan. We are just about an hour, 50 minutes into this third game 
folks of the 2023 FIDE World Championship. And uh, the brunt of the action is still ahead. But before we take our first break of the day, we wanted to remind you that if you dreamed of playing in the FIDE World Championship, well, Chess.com is making your dreams come true, sort of. Uh, you can now challenge both World Championship contenders in bot form. Dingley Ren and Yana Pomnishi bots are available for play right now at chess.com slash play slash computer. So head over there and let us know if you can beat the bots. Use exclam FWC bots, all one word, in the chat. Or go to chess.com slash play slash computer and match your wits against all sorts of bots, including Ding and Nepo. Well, speaking of Ding, he is at the board. He has been at the board for the vast majority of this game. A welcome sign for Ding fans and a welcome sign uh, the kind of position that he has managed to get, one that might be a little bit less familiar for Yanda Pomnishi. And we will see how both of these players tackle the challenges as they head into the middle game. And we will head into a break. We will be back with more action from the FIDE World Championship in just a couple of moments. Mike Klein here for Chess.com. Longtime fans of the World Championship know that one of the most divisive elements of this event is what should happen in case of a 7-7 tie. What is the best tiebreaker? And I think we finally nailed it. It's going to be the battle of facial hair. Now, Ding's got a little bit of a mustache going there. He's got some work to do. And if we run down, let's see how Nepomish he's looking in this stock photo. A little bit better, but I see lots of stubble. He's really got to let that fill in. We will see at the end of three weeks which man has grown it better.
We are back at the 2023 FIDE World Championship. Ding Li Ren is playing Yana Pomnishi's Blazer. Nope, he is playing Yana Pomnishi, who is somewhere in the playing hall, probably in the rest area. They are in the midst of a Carlsbad structure, one of the oldest Queen's Gambit declined structures. It's been popular for well over 100 years, and they are just entering uh, what promises to be a very complex and rich positional middle game. Okay, the last move. 15, knight to c1, as we see. Yana Pomnishi, comfortable lounging in the rest area, pulling a Dingley Ren. And Ding, of course, has been sitting at the board for most of the game. David, knight c1. It's pretty clear that Nepo is preparing f3, e4. And our general consens consensus seems to be that Yana isn't particularly comfortable, particularly familiar with the structure, but he is up 15 minutes on the clock. Yeah, and the 15-minute advantage might come into play a bit later on, still early days in this one. Ding's kept up a good speed if we compare it to uh, game one and game two. I think he'll be feeling much more confident here as Black. Yes, he spent over half an hour, but he has also banked almost 15 minutes, uh, almost, oh, sorry, almost 15 moves. So um, he won't be too concerned in that uh, department. Also, his position is full of resources. There's a lot of choice right now. Anish was... Uh, really liking this queen g5 move for black activating maybe asking some questions about how white is going to uh, set up and uh, anish also in the break uh, you were mentioning that uh, this still follows your game against ding himself yeah i looked it up in fact uh, queen g5 is not necessary ding played knight f6 back against me it's an excellent move and i i think yan has um, really mixed things up because i think what he has done um, and what I have done, this is not really promising, this knight c1 idea here. Because after knight f6, I played f3, which is logical. And then Dick played knight e6 first. I played queen to f2, which was also logical. And here, Dink played c5, which eventually equalized, but the engine suggests b5 uh, and uh, likes black's position a lot uh, here. Already slightly negative. Um, I, I think that this... Plan is a common knowledge idea. This knight c1 because of the because of the game I won against Fresenet, maybe some other games before or after that. Um, but I don't think it's actually that good. Uh, and I'm a little surprised that Dig is taking this much time. Maybe he's doubting himself because Jan is playing so quickly. But actually, Jan is not playing so quickly. For Jan Standers, having spent 20 minutes in the opening it means he's probably out of book. A small, actually, in fact, a small. Uh, oversight on Jan's part. He has never played, uh, he has almost never played the Nimso. He's not familiar with d4 positions. And uh, Dink has played this before, this particular uh, sequence entirely. And so uh, Jan should have been, you know, a little bit more ready. Ding also a little bit surprising that he's taking this much time. I'm slightly puzzled by uh, why both players are taking this long. I think yeah, Jan shouldn't have been surprised by Carlsbad. but Ding uh, shouldn't be surprised by the game that he already had before. I mean, against me, he played the best move, knight of six. If he will now not play the best move, uh, that would just be very, very strange. Yeah. Do you think uh, it's just, again, it's the mind games, it's the nerves that are forcing him to think, forcing him to kind of second guess and doubt himself? Because otherwise, uh, he must have analyzed that game with you, at least uh, even briefly. And uh, if there were no problems, then why not repeat? Uh, so I think what, like something's going on. what has happened um, is that Ding has concluded a that, that long time ago that this, what White has done, what I have done is not principled. So he has sort of uh, studied much more principled uh, setups by White, much more principled ideas. And he just never came back to this anymore. And so he simply forgot uh, what his solution was. And um, that is perhaps why he's taking so much time. It's because sometimes when somebody does something uh, very harmless, then you just uh, don't look at it anymore and then you forget it. And you, what you remember much more is the more critical continuations. Perhaps he remembers some critical lines, in the, but this he just thought, okay, this was bad. And now he's trying to remember why was this not so principled? What was what did I do? Was it my game against uh, Anish or not? Anyway, that's these games that we played. I mean, I remember them, but uh, for him it was Deep Knight. You know, there's the jet lag, there's this time difference and the Champions Tour events were always very late. He was playing at 4 a.m. in the morning. I think he was barely awake, maybe, you know, making a draw against me in a half-awake state. Doesn't even remember um, what what was happening there. He did win that tournament, but, uh, you know, that's because he's very talented. Maybe he was just half asleep, doesn't even uh, remember what, what happened in that game. But th what happened is knight f6, f3, knight e6. And so uh, maybe Jan will not play f3. Maybe he'll go for knight b3 instead. 
But after knight f6, knight b3, knight e6, I don't see a, a, a big idea for white uh, other than f3. The, I saw the computer suggests a very interesting plan to go knight d2 to f3 to reroute the knight from e2 <laughs> via b3, d2 to f3. Okay, possible, but um, very very artificial and also not uh, not too, too scary. Um, but yeah, Ding is uh, slightly puzzling. He spent already 40 minutes from the start of the game. 40 minutes. And he seems to be genuinely thinking. Look at He's just genuinely reaching the depth uh, of his, uh, you know, of his mind, trying to think. Uh, but this is nothing new. He has had it himself. Very surprising. Yeah, and maybe... Uh, my... mm -hmm. oh, sorry, go on, Daniel. No, maybe just psyching himself out a little bit. Like, did he look up my game against Anish Giri? Do I need to deviate? You know, sometimes you get into your head like that, David, and you can just you can just endlessly spin spin your wheels in that regard. Yeah, exactly. Um, took the words out of my mouth, pretty much. He's definitely overthinking this one. And uh, it could be one of those cases, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I play a lot of Blitz games, a lot of Rapid games on chess.com, and sometimes they all just blur into one. So it's like, is this this exact position? With the knights on different squares, with the pawns on different squares, so he probably remembers that game, especially if he won the tournament. Was it the Chessable Masters 2022? Yes, no, David. David, so, this is a Chess.com broadcast. Here we we say that uh, each game that we play at Chess.com is so important for us. We remember each one of them, and they're very dear. So please don't uh, don't get yourself confused. They, <laughs> yeah, they're all very dear. They help me get to where I am today. Those games, of course, but I'm more talking about my memory. <laughs> and uh, as I get older, it tends to fade. <laughs> all the details they do blur into one. All these move orders, especially, especially in these kind of closed lock positions where uh, each tempo is maybe uh, less valuable, and therefore it's difficult to remember. Uh, I have the same with the Italian game, for example. So many mm. different move orders, and oh you know, my god! Start if you don't get me detail. started, <laughs> don't get me started in the Italian, David. Oh my gosh! Italian is a, is a big Italian is a big uh, topic of conversation among the top players. Uh, everybody complains, you know, about the move orders. That is one. There's one opening with lots of move orders. This one, Karlsbad structure, is also very confusing because uh, the positions where the pawn structure is the same and the moves are all similar but can be made in different move order. These are the confusing ones. And here too, so the structure is kind of static, and Black can trade the bishops with knight h5, with knight e8. The other knight can go to f6, b6, f8. It's all kind of similar but somewhat different. Sometimes white has these positions, for example, with the queen on c2, sometimes not with the queen on c2. And uh, so these my subtle differences, yeah, they can get very confusing. Uh, but I suspect that indeed what we see here is Ding thinking, and I understand him. And that's what I, a mistake I make a lot in my chess as well, and I try to learn from it, but it's so hard. You constantly think rationally that your opponent must have prepared, because you had a game, this World Championship match, the stakes are high, so often, your opponent just for some reason hasn't prepared, and you overthink it. And I have, yeah. And finally, he plays knight f6. And I've made this mistake a lot. Um, you overthink it, and then finally, the reason is something very stupid. The opponent just says, "Yeah, we just forgot." You know, there's always a human error in chess as well, in the chess prep as well. You just forget something, and um, there's no need to believe that your opponent has everything worked out. He spent 20 minutes. Jan, Jan didn't look at this. He forgot uh, for some reason. He just followed some game that he had seen at some point, which was my game against Dink. Not sure if he even remembers what he follows. So Dink should just play confidently, play what he already played, and finally he plays knight of six. Yeah, and Black's position is kind of structurally sound. He hasn't played any kind of strange looking moves, so there's no reason he should be objectively uh, kind of significantly worse anyway. So uh, I agree, Anish. Sometimes you just got to trust your opening. Uh, I love the mug, by the way, Anish. <laughs> you just got to <laughs> trust your opening. And uh, yeah, if your opponent's prepared something deep, fine. There's still going to be a way out of it if you're accurate a bit later on, if you've saved enough time to work things out. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe just confidence issue there uh, caused him to think a bit longer than normal. I'm fully aware of uh, those pitfalls. I've done it so many times myself. But uh, okay, knight of six, it's a good move. And uh, one that I think we're all happy to see, maybe other than Jan. Uh, mm -hmm. How long do we think he'll pause here before replying? Very long. I think it'll take an hour and a half, actually. <laughs> He'll have eight <laughs> minutes after the next move. <laughs> oh, but look, it's exa it's happening exactly exactly what I told you. Because I looked at this with the computer now. F3 is also not, uh, not the best move. He is mixing up my game with his prep. That's what's happening. He's just following my game blindly, thinking that that's his prep. This is just my game. It was not very good. Anish, 
following your game is always a, a good way to do. It doesn't matter what your prep is. You can be safe in the knowledge that you followed in the footsteps of Anish Giri. I feel very <laughs> flattered. Yeah, but this is really not not so great. No, just ninety six. Uh, he, he will play Queen F two. It's clear to me already. He just he just remembers my game. That's all he remembers. But after Queen F two, the engine suggests this move B five. But I'm not even sure that uh, that Dink Dink might just repeat our game and play C five. I mean, I'm not sure Dink uh, has analyzed this because it was so um, so uh, non critical what I did. Uh, I don't even know B five. What exactly is the point? So if E four. I suspect before? before is before I suspect. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, yeah, because I was wondering, um, is it is it D E four F E four knight G four actually? Hmm. E four is not even a threat. Mm. This queen G three yeah, knight takes D four. That's why what I did makes no sense. This this idea with F three queen F two is just it just makes no sense. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, remind us how that game went then, Anish. So B5 looks uh, strong, as you mentioned, but you played, uh, played, uh, Ding sorry, played, Ding C5. played C5. Because he assumed that E4 is uh, is a threat, and he reacted uh, with C5, which is very not, not natural. And then, OK, I don't remember anymore what I did. I, I think I might have taken on C5. At some point, I played bishop to B5. And um, you know, I can tell you what happened. What happened is I played very slowly, and we traded a bunch of pieces. And at some point, I kept like uh, two rooks, a knight, and a queen uh, against two rooks, a knight, and a queen. And I was trying to put pressure on the d5 pawn, but I had to constantly uh, watch out for my e3 pawn. And finally, I just didn't see anything to do, and um, I was not better at all. And eventually, we traded the e3 pawn for the d5 pawn, and it was a drawn rook endgame. So even what Ding did was kind of good enough. But uh, apparently, instead of c5, this b5, because e4 is not even a threat. So yeah, it is just uh, it's just not. Uh, yeah, it looks very it looks very smart the plan. Like doesn't it? Knight c1, queen f2. Like it looks like something very smart, no? <laughs> yeah, a bit too clever, right? Uh, sometimes <laughs> when players try to be too sophisticated, they don't actually improve their position. They just lose a bunch of time. This might be one of those cases, but I, I know what you mean. It looks very harmonious for white, but if you can't play e4, then it doesn't make it much also, sense. It also looks like prep. Like if you click through this, like huh. you see that <laughs> rook e1, knight c1, f3, queen f2, you are like, oh, nice. This guy, you know, he figured out some deep concept. Nice regroup. It looks really nice, but it's just, uh, it was well, kind of old, old knowledge slash improvisation of mine, which is just not good, which was just not good. But for rapid, it's okay. Uh, but for World Championship match, yeah, you you hope for a little bit better prep, of course, than this. It sh it seems that there's this tactical flaw, right? Which Queen on F2 is targeted by Knight F6 to G4. There are other ways to prepare E3 E4. So from an uninitiated standpoint, after Knight to E6, uh, as awkward as this move looks, maybe Knight one to E2. I mean, I get that it severs the connection between the Rook and the E3 pawn, uh, but. Black did the same with his last move. But again, maybe c5 is even more effective here now that the e3 pawn is unprotected. So it, it looks like the one-two punch of the possibility of b5 as well as the possibility of c5 is just what renders White's plan too slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I must say, I mean, I understand there is logic to go knight c1 to allow yourself to go f3 and then you come back because I played knight e6. But that being said, still knight to c1 and knight back to e2 that that is not very aesthetically pleasing. And um, I mean, we can, of course, talk about this position. It's an interesting position. But I think it is pretty clear that um, this is not Jan's, uh, Jan's prep. And uh, we, we should not try to justify, you know, the, should not try to justify it. And uh, uh, I, I am mainly curious curious to see if uh, Ding, because Ding, of course, he doesn't know it. He doesn't remember exactly the evaluation of the computer. He, he is pretty sure that Jan is prepared because, you know, you assume the best of your opponent. And so he is kind of worried, of course, but I guess he will soon find out that there is nothing to, to worry about. And he will, he will, I hope, follow that, uh, the, our game and play 96, which is the best move. Yeah, I mean, what seems to be helping him is that e4 is a threat in this very position. So he doesn't have all that many candidate moves. 
So one way or the other, you know, by hook or by crook, he's going to stumble into this line. And after the game, he's going to regret, you know, taking all of this time. And, you know, you might have heard us because 96 is on the board. And we'll see how quickly Nepo responds with Queen F2 or doesn't respond with Queen F2. Ding has finally gotten back, gotten up on the board. <laughs> he has played out yeah, three quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he played Queen F2 quickly. I think Jan is, by, by this point, uh, you know, he is a lost man um, who, who <laughs> believes that my game is the ultimate, ultimate truth and his preparation. So I'm, I will not be surprised to see Young playing Queen F2 very quickly and very confidently. But um, yeah, this is not, not, not a good move. I have to say that uh, Ding's uh, dam clock damage is rather limited. Uh, okay, David knows more about clock management than, uh, than me. Uh, he knows all the ins and outs of spending time. But uh, one hour, 11 minutes is plenty of time still. And uh, even though he wasted uh, his like 50 or at least 40 minutes, it's, it's still uh, the damage is somewhat limited uh, on Ding's part. And if he gets a good position, he has plenty of time to, uh, to make sense of it all. Yeah, an interesting shot of Jan there, just chilling out in uh, his rest area. Maybe he realized that he has been fooled by me. When he's looking at the position and he's like, this makes no sense what this guy did. Why am I even following him? He's too wow. far down the rabbit hole now. No turning yeah. back. Too late. Too late. I'm sorry, Jan. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I mean, is there a case to be made for, and I keep trying to infuse this position with new life. I, I get the black is, is doing fine, but if B5 is a serious problem, I mean, would we consider a move like E4? I feel like the positional gods are laughing at me, but does white have to make a move which prepares E4 or is there some move that basically treads water and takes the sting out of B5? I mean, A4 is so desperate. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think the it's the case. Yeah, there is, I think there's a good saying for this. It's it's the case of um, the medicine. What is the English mm -hmm. way of saying it? The medicine medicine being, is worse than the cure. Sorry, I mean, medicine no, is worse than the disease. <laughs> yeah, maybe the cure is worse than the disease or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. But th that that is the case of A4. I think B5 is not such a big threat that. Um, it's worth stopping it with a4. It is a very ugly move a4, of course, although it's not as bad as it looks, perhaps, because you you do also fixate that b5 square in case of c5. So after black will play c5, the pawn a4 will look a lot better. But uh, from the moves we've seen so far, I, I think knight 1 to e2 surprisingly looks uh, the most sensible to me. Uh, maybe. Because knight b3 doesn't really create a threat of e4, because there is a4 after that. Mm. And okay, after knight 1, e2, I think the big question is... Um, the big question is if e4 is actually a, a threat. There are many ways to prevent this e4 move, yeah? I mean, I besides this b5 and c5, I can also move my queen to like d8. It also stops e4. Mm -hmm. Many options. I was going to ask, do we think uh, Jan is going to feed into this narrative that he's still in preparation just to try and scare Ding, keep the mind games going? But he's certainly kind of uh, revealed the truth now by pausing, not coming back to the board immediately, not uh, kind of instantly playing a move such as Queen F2. And uh, yeah, I mean, all of these ideas you're mentioning, they make some sense, but uh, Jan's got to weigh all of these up. I mean, A4 has long-term consequences. Uh, Knight back to E2 feels like an admission of defeat somehow. And uh, if Queen F2 isn't convincing either, then he's not going to be feeling too happy inside um, his first yeah. think in at least a while now. That all said, uh, okay, so let's say um, his plan is not working out. The E4 push is not happening. That all said, even without doing anything and you just sit on this position, white isn't worse uh, either. So white has a solid position, but of course, so your first goal coming out of the opening is to get some play. We want to get some initiative. If that failed, okay, then you look at how how big is the damage, how bad is your position. And here the position is fine. Position is still equal. And uh, so no damage, no big damage done. Jan can still play some pointless moves like King H1 or any any move uh, back and mm -hmm. forth. And, uh, I don't know about that, Anish. And I was going to actually show a tactic oh, with that same oh, idea. Nice. But nice. it was the only move of blunders. Congratulations, no, but Anish. There's one more. 
let me one up you. There's one where there's Bishop F5, which I thought was interesting. I think Bishop F5 instead also falls for Knight takes D4. And after ED4, Queen E1, at the end of the line, it looks like White emerges with a queen and a piece for the two rooks. But no, King F2, Bishop takes F5, and the queen is overextended. Yes. And Rook takes C1. Black, of course, has an overwhelming amount of material for the queen. So there are latent tactics in this position. Anytime there's two rooks in a standoff, there always are going to be tactics. That's why I don't like to play bullet against Dania, because this is how our games usually end up. At H1, you go knight D4 instantly. And I'd be like, why did I find the only move in this position to blunder something? <laughs> well, sneaky stuff. Just to put that on the board and back rank checkmate incoming. Wow, you know, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at Impressive Jan. Stuff. <laughs> and I uh, want to mention that, so when you believe that you are following your prep and you are actually not, there comes a moment sooner or later and it'd rather be sooner than later. When you realize that every like the dots connect in your mind and you realize, oh, wait a second, I've got it all wrong. And I think we've reached that point now, uh, judging from the body language and um, Jan's thinking. I think he remembers queen f2, but he so slowly sees that the move queen f2 makes no sense. And then he's, it slowly dawns on him that, wait, that was not the prep. Wait. And then, and now you see he's not too thrilled. And uh, he's taking his time. And okay, he has to basically switch to to plan B and just play some chess and not 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 King H1 nor Bishop F5, but uh, some neutral move. So maybe Knight B3, Knight 1, E2. Uh, I don't know what other moves are, are there. Queen to D2 maybe. Uh, but it's not fun because, you know, when, especially when you're already committed to F3, you really want to prepare an E4. That's really the point of F3. Otherwise, it's just a weakening move. Yeah, it's it's a move that has a plan. So you really, you really want to push to prepare E4, and you don't want to just uh, play F3 and then start playing aimlessly. Yeah, it's always the hardest when you finally have to engage your brain. You can't rely on preparation or pattern recognition anymore. And uh, yeah, already in the tank for over five minutes now, Jan. Um, I'm expecting it to be longer and. If I were Ding, I would come back to sit at the board just to sit and uh, stare him down, gaining in confidence uh, just by the fact he's thinking. And for Ding, it's the it's a great moment. It's the opposite. So Jan was playing fast. So Ding is like bracing for impact. He realizes that he is following his own game, and he's like, "Okay, now will come a note. Now will come a note." And and as you brace for impact, and you see that nothing comes, and that is a huge moment of relief. And uh, then you realize, "Oh, wait a second. He just." My opponent just had nothing in mind, actually. My opponent had something mixed up, and I'm actually fine. And this was a false uh, false flag. So um, you look, hands in the pocket, ding with the swag there. The jacket is on the sofa. He's walking around, all cool. Mm -hmm. 82. Night 82 on the board. Yeah. The move that made most sense to me, I must say, at this point. Yeah, and uh, notice how Ding came in, looked at the screen, realized uh, a move had just been played, and I think he's walking back to the board. There we go. Takes his seat again. Uh, so different from game two, I guess, where we saw him sitting there just kind of staring at the screen, realizing he prefers the physical pieces. And yeah, we weren't too impressed by this move either. It feels like White's kind of yo-yoing back and forth, a bit of indecision. But uh, the key question is, E4, a threat or not right now? Yeah, I believe uh, there are uh, two options in these kind of positions. So, uh, and I think it depends a lot on whether Ding has looked at our game uh, in great detail after, or he, he just concluded that the game was fine. Sometimes, you know, you play a game, it was not too forcing, and you just, uh, you sort of think, okay, you concluded something from the game, and you don't analyze it again. So there are two plans. There's the plan of C5 and the plan of B5. And if Ding hasn't looked at our game in detail, he will just play C5 because he would conclude from the game that C5 is fine and it is fine. But if Ding had looked at our game, he would know that B5 is even stronger. And here as well, B5 is uh, a move preferred by the computer, which is actually much more double-edged. So I think this is a big, uh, big moment. So C5, the more human move, and B5 is a move of someone who is better prepared and already looked at it with the, with the computer. 
Of course, you can also make a neutral move, like I mentioned queen d8, but I didn't like queen d8. I mean, it, it prevents e4, but I don't think uh, it improves black's position by any means. So I, I think either c5 or b5 is what I expect. Let's see. Yeah, e4 just seems very unimpressive to me because the d4 pawn is such a big weakness. I'm trying to tease out the complications. David, maybe you can help me out. b5, e4, if we could put that on the board. Um, not sure in what order black should do things, but let's say d, e, f, e. First, I mean, black has a lot of question to answer. Should black throw in b4, which is not necessarily given because knight g4 is a very typical move um, in these Carlsbad positions because this comes really fast. If white plays knight g3, Already there are tactics. Knight, knight takes d4 is hanging. Knight takes h2. Everything falls apart if you make one step in the wrong direction. But other than knight g4, black could also play on the queen side with b5, b4. So I think you guys have better intuition in this structure. I don't really play this with either color. So David, I'll start with you. How do you think black should approach this position? Maybe queen a7? Yeah, <laughs> so many forcing moves. Here I would just start by looking, kind of going back to basics, looking for those uh, threats. Uh, all those uh, moves that actually force white to react. Queen a7, like you say, Dania, uh, looks very tempting. I guess there you have to figure out, uh, can white even defend the d4 pawn? If not, we might just uh, be able to go for this with confidence. Um, queen a7, yeah, I would be looking whether white has any sacrifices. I don't think they quite work on f6 just to open up the black king. Knight g4 as well, massive threats on the board uh, in multiple directions. Um, I'd be calculating that one very eagerly. I think maybe it if I were Yan as white uh, after a move like b5, of course I want to play e4, but I would be panicking after uh, seeing that black has so many options that create so many threats. And um, of course it's calculation time. That's how the players do things at this level. But uh, yeah, just a kind of superficial glance and all of these look very tempting. b4, queen a7, knight g4, all of them create threats. At what point do you even kind of uh, stop calculating as white? Um, I think it would be <laughs> over the next couple of moves and I'd say, okay, too soon got to look for options so here maybe uh yan would be looking kind of in a different direction maybe knight g3 we mentioned just trying to get around to the f5 square um if in doubt why not save a bit of time on the clock and go for something less forcing that keeps the game um keeps the game tense um yeah how about you anish yeah i agree with uh, with what you just said i think e4 as Dania mentioned, I mean, it's a nice exercise to think of what is the roughest punishment to e4 maybe it is uh the knight, queen, queen a7 or not queen a7 knight g4 or queen a7 without de like it's it's a nice little challenge but it's not something Jan is looking into so e4 he sees he I think enough to see queen a7 to just say okay I'm not doing that um, I believe indeed uh, I like this knight g3 followed by knight c2 e2 potentially I think it's a sensible regroup I have to be frank the computer really liked black here um, suggesting that black is very very comfortable but it is not entirely obvious to me optically, and I, you, you can tell me if you agree or not, but like, I still kind of like the look of this for white uh, because my bishop uh, is kind of more active and black's pawn structure like optically looks weaker and the bishop looks kind of, you know, light squared bishop, light squared pawns. It's kind of bad vibes there for black. But I guess the computer comes up with quick b4, c5, and lots of counterplay. And the fact that I weakened my e3 pawn is a big, big downside. So I guess um, the position here is comfortable for black, but I guess, yeah, uh, after b5, e4 is out of question and it's probably knight g3. Uh, what else? Maybe knight. Yeah, I, I think I think you need to address the, you need to address the, the knight on c3 situation. And uh, it's not, not easy to say what uh, what to do. I hand it over to, uh, to Dania. Maybe Dania has some smart thoughts for white after b5. No, I, I understand what you're saying, because if white can engineer the right set of circumstances, e4 can be incredibly dangerous, and we know that. And knight f5 could come, e4, e5. So the, the potential of e4 is not in question, but there's just so many moving parts to take care of. There's the d4 pawn, there's b5, b4, there's c6, c5. So, it, it, But for Ding, he has to actually choose. You can't just come to a restaurant and look at all the items, you actually have to choose something off the menu, and that can be incredibly hard. Like the abundance of options can potentially be a bad thing, especially as you're dipping, I don't want to say low on the clock, but imperceptibly, he's almost spent uh, already half of his time. And as Ding continues to ponder the proper course of action, I think it's a good opportunity for us uh, to remind ourselves of the topsy-turvy path that Mr. Ding took to get to where he is right now in Astana. Let's take a listen. Thank you. 
Ding Li Ren's unpredictable path to this year's FIDE World Championship was born from the right combination of good fortune and persistent gameplay. Ding's journey to Kazakhstan almost never got started. Travel restrictions in China prevented him from qualifying for the candidates, the gateway tournament to the World Championship. But when a spot unexpectedly opened up, Ding ground away to earn the vacated seat and punch his ticket to Madrid. His foot in the candidate's door, Ding struggled in the first half of the tournament, failing to earn a win and falling to the eventual winner, Yana Pomnishi. But that's when the magic began. In the second half, Ding began to turn things around, starting with a resounding win over Jan Krzysztof Duda. We have a victory for Ding Li Ren, and his candidate's chances are not gone at this time. Ding then continued his momentum with back-to-back -back wins over Richard Rapport and Fabiano Caruana. In his final match of the tournament, Ding squared off with Hikaru Nakamura in a battle for second place. With rumors suggesting Magnus Carlsen might step down as champion, second place at the candidates now had an entirely new meaning. Needing a win, Ding took advantage of a missed opportunity by Hikaru on move 38 and worked steadily from there to secure the victory and second place. The second half of the tournament has been his four wins in seven games. While his runner-up finish at the candidates was certainly an accomplishment, Ding left Madrid without a seat at the World Championship. That all changed later that summer when Magnus announced he would not be defending his title. With the five-time champion out of the mix, Ding's second place finish at the candidates suddenly became a golden ticket to Kazakhstan with the rare opportunity to cement his name amongst the distinguished list of FIDE World Champions. Much like his opponent, Ding chose to skip most of the high-profile classical events over the past few months, and instead selected to immerse himself in his preparation to face Nepomnishi. Time will tell if that approach and Ding's string of good luck and competitiveness will earn him the most famous title in classical chess. So many trials and tribulations that Ding Li Ren went through to get to where he is now. It was not guaranteed until Magnus Carlsen shockingly stepped down, abdicated his world champion throne. And wow, Ding Li Ren has yet another comeback to make. He's been full of comebacks in this past year. David, I just, what impresses me the most, I think, is his resilience. The fact that in the candidates, he had incredibly painful moments, that 20 move loss with the Black Pieces against Timur Rajabov. Were you as impressed as I was? I was on site in Madrid, just kept getting shot down, kept getting back up again, and he's rewarded with a seat at the World Championship table. Yeah, certainly, Danya. Uh, I'm one of Ding's, uh, Ding's biggest fans, and uh, just the way he yeah, just kind of gracefully uh, kind of puts these runs together. Remember that 100-game unbeaten streak as well. He's just such a classy player, and I think he needs to take inspiration from his journey to this point his uh, journey to the World Championship match. It wasn't always, uh, kind of, it didn't always start well, like you say, at the candidates, but it ended uh, it ended in good fashion. And uh, he's got to hope that the match goes the same way. Of course, he lost game two, but it's still early days and plenty of time to recover, just like he did in the candidates. And it does feel like it's written in the stars somehow. <laughs> he was on the outside looking in and he kind of got gifted this path and he seized it, seized the opportunity with two hands and... Yeah, Anish, what are your thoughts? Uh, despite the fact he's one point down now, despite the fact he's half an hour down on the clock in this game, still chances to make that fairy tale come true? Oh, very much so. And as I mentioned earlier, when uh, we spoke about it with uh, spoke about it with Dania in one of the earlier broadcasts, I find it kind of remarkable the, the his path, uh, where on the one hand it seemed that he was very unlucky and unfortunate, as everything was going wrong with. Uh, the COVID uh, affecting him most from compared to all other players, even as restrictions been lifted in most countries. China was the last one, uh, one of the last countries when he wasn't able to travel. He wasn't able to get the necessary number of games to qualify. He wasn't able to play the Grand Prix, for example. He was scheduled to, to fly to Grand Prix. It didn't work out because of some visa issues. So everything went against him. He was very unlucky. And then it's turned around, but turned around completely. Like he's he started getting just so so lucky in, in, in turn and uh, 
he managed to qualify to the candidates because he was just in time to get himself a bunch of games against Chinese players. Like some tournaments started appearing from nowhere. Um, yeah, C5 was, is indeed played. Uh, just to finish my point, then also, of course, he was lucky in the candidates because he finished second. Even that was not a given. He was simply at the bottom of the tournament table after the first uh, first half. And then he he managed to finish second uh, just, just in time, winning in the last round. And that was enough to qualify. It's never, ever been enough to qualify earlier in the chess history, but this time it was. And uh, maybe here too, you know, it starts off badly, but uh, things will turn around. And he played C5. The, that seems seems to to me that uh, he was also very influenced by the game that uh, we, we had, uh, that I played against him. And um, he probably didn't study this B5 kind of ideas in much depth. He was just satisfied with the C5 concept, which, uh, which is a more natural human concept, uh, trying to equalize the position and uh, have this D5 weakness compensated by the E3 weakness. I guess a very solid position now for, for your ding, but B5 would offer more counter chances, more double-edged game, more of a three-result game, something I would personally be looking forward to much more. I, I don't know. David, I want your take on this. I'm going to be honest, I don't like C5 at all, and the move that keeps circling around in my head is Bishop D3 to B5. I've been thinking about it in issues you've been sharing your insights, and I, for some reason, can't find like a satisfactory answer. If Bishop D7... I don't want to go too concrete. Then takes, my idea was takes, queen takes, and knight c3 uh, to, to a4. And suddenly there's knight b6 and knight takes c5. It's a double attack. Uh, I call this forking a fork because you're threatening a fork as well as the pawn on c5. And I don't know, like that earlier point that we made about the b5 square being weak. David, do you feel like Ding is going a little bit too much for the bailout here with c5? It does feel that way. Um, if Ding was playing a less uh, high pressure match, maybe, uh, if he was playing a lower rated opponent such as myself, maybe he would have uh, tried to keep more tension. And we were looking at lines with B5, where, as Anish said, it's three results. You're kind of uh, setting some traps potentially for white. But um, yeah, I mean, I didn't see this uh, tactical shot with B uh, Bishop B5, I've got to say. But uh, even strategically, it's very risky for black now. The D5 pawn is forever weak. And this can be targeted later on. The black knight on F6, not necessarily the most stable piece long term. Um, even if you kind of trade pawns and make a symmetrical pawn structure, you do have holes in your camp. Yeah, I would be hesitant. Um, I don't think white should take this. I think a lot of uh, viewers at home might be wondering, oh, white can give black an isolated pawn. But uh, as Anish said earlier, uh, this e3 pawn is just as weak, if not weaker, than uh, black's d5 pawn. So maybe this is one thing he's hoping for. But uh, as you point out, Daniel, yeah, bishop b5, one option. I'm wondering how you even react if white just kind of sidesteps and plays a move like queen d2 and waits. Uh, what is Black's next move? Um, yeah, strategically, maybe not that desirable, and it does come with some risks. Um, well, I, Anish, wouldn't, uh, uh, I wouldn't personally exaggerate this danger. So, Danny, I had exactly the same thought as you in my game. I also got excited about Bishop B5 in uh, the position mm -hmm. that I had there. But uh, I remember after Bishop D7, in my game too, there was something that got me excited. So I was thinking, okay, very nice. But actually, uh, he just played Rook D8. And here as well, you just play rook d8, damage mm -hmm. is very limited. There is no, mm -hmm. you can exploit my uh, slight uh, lag, lag in development. And at the same time, uh, white can also play queen d2 indeed now or move earlier. But I think while I don't like c5 because b5 was more funky, I don't think that c5 is bad um, in terms of black trying to equalize. I think that after c5, Jan will eventually, uh, sorry, Ding will eventually yeah, slowly but surely equalize. I think these positions just in the long run are okay for black. Um, I also thought they're better for white when I had my game, but I really uh, struggled in that game to put pressure. And so mm. I'm really curious to see if Jan will be able to. I don't trust Jan. Um, as I mentioned, he's not known to be a D4 player. Uh, I don't trust him to play this super precisely. And I think black is just conceptually all right. After queen d2, I don't need to rush with c4 because you want to play c4 only if you can follow up with b5 before. Otherwise, it's a huge strategical concession. You just release the tension. Instead, I think black has ideas like bishop d7. You can defend the d5 pawn with bishop c6 if really necessary. I think you can just play passively with black. And I think even the worst case scenario, things will be quite, uh, uh, quite little for white because only one weakness on d5 
especially with the pawn and f3 weakening the e3 pawn. I just think that uh, there is just not too much danger for black. But of course, I'm not happy to see c5 because I was hoping for b5 uh, as uh, someone who was uh, who is rooting for Ding's comeback to make the match uh, even more exciting. I was hoping for a three-result game. But I, I wouldn't exaggerate the, the dangers for black here. Yeah, so maybe not uh, the move you wanted to see, Anish, but not a bad move either. That's the conclusion. And... Um... Yeah, how do we think White will react if Bishop B5 doesn't lead to anything concrete? A chaos. Oh, he's played <laughs> it. Commentator's curse. Now, he's played it. I, I want to point something out to Anisha's point. Rook D8, I thought initially Knight A4 is very strong, just kind of surrounding the queen side's curse, but I think there might be Knight E6 to C7. The retreating knight moves are so easy to miss, and suddenly I feel like Black takes over the initiative because Queen takes C5 impossibly, you drop a piece. Black just takes the queen and takes the uh, bishop, and E3 is hanging. So... White is the one who wants to fork with knight a4, but then black is the one with the double attack after going knight c7. This is really easy to miss. Backward knight moves. They're the, always the trickiest ones. Um, yeah, do you think that, I mean, surely it would be on uh, Nepomniachtchi's radar before he plays a move like knight a4. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're expecting... Mm -hmm. You're not so sure, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he'll see it. In a world championship match, the world number two player. But hey, I am known to jinx even the best players. So I'm going to ab just abstain from this conversation because I've done enough damage already. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm sure Ding here, after a bit of thought, will play Rook D8. As we mentioned, uh, the alternative didn't look too convincing blocking with Bishop D7. So um, yeah, uh, people were mentioning in the chat I met, I saw uh, the clock usage, the clock times. It is move 18, or it will be Ding's 18th move. and. Uh, he spent just over an hour. If he plays the next two or three quickly, then he'll still have almost an hour left for 20 moves. That's roughly how you should apportion your time. Um, it's uh, Yeah, you start with two hours, 40 moves. If you use one hour for the first 20, it's fine. So as long as he speeds up slightly, uh, I'm still not too uh, pessimistic about his chances on the clock. And it does feel like the position is becoming more concrete, so the decisions will be slightly easier, at least over the next few turns for Ding. Well, I should add, David, that... Uh... You did the math slightly uh, unfair there because you are always team spending time, of course. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it is not exactly one hour for 20 moves, one hour for the other 20 moves because, uh, of course, you start with the opening where you play a few moves instantly. But it's not exactly that. I do think he spent a little, a little too much time. But uh, that being said, it's a position he's familiar with. It's a pretty solid structure. I think clock will not be the main issue. Uh, and I'm really curious to see whether Jan will be able to put some pressure here whether he'll be able to create something and uh besides i i want to take a look at bishop d7 uh, once again because bishop d7 is a very uh, principled way of playing trying to trade these bishops which would probably benefit black uh easing the defensive task and i want to see after knight a4 because knight a4 is a move i was shocked to see uh i didn't really see this idea Daniel, of course very very sharp i just want to take a look at this position just to uh, let it sink in and see if there is not uh, a uh, a defense here for for black because if there would be then bishop b7 would be justified and I think this is what Ding is looking at. Are there really no counter resources here? Hmm. For example, for example, uh, I could it is a bit crazy. Right? I could go c d knight b6 queen d6 knight a8 d e and I will re I will be able to uh, regain uh, the um, the knight but uh, i will probably uh, lose the um, the e3 pawn so i'm not sure if that whole operation makes sense mm -hmm. this is very complicated a niche suddenly it could go either way uh, i'm sure for example an engine would say white uh, is doing okay here white has extra material uh, these black pawns can be stopped in the center but from a human point of view this is very tempting though no? um, at least if you're yes, in a muscle uh, situation especially... Especially because my idea is that if you attack my e3 pawn, I'm going to go for d4. I will not bother to take your knight. Mm. So I, I want to see that. Uh, so this is one thing. Maybe after knight a4, there are some other ideas. Because, uh, okay, we have to first, before you go rook d8, which is a ba backup, we have to establish that this doesn't work for black. Because if it does, you rather play bishop d7 than rook d8. Because rook d8, anyway, your idea uh, eventually will probably be to trade off this uh, bishop on b5, right? With bishop d7. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're slightly cramped as black, so it makes sense to exchange pieces if you can. But uh, yeah, I mean, this one is very complicated. Does Ding invest 
20 minutes uh, here on an idea like C takes D4, sacrificing his rook in the corner when he could just play rook D8 very comfortably and no immediate consequences. Even a time travel Point. addict like me <laughs> doesn't advocate for a long tank here uh, when you have a relatively healthy option. Point, and especially the fact that he already is down on the clock uh, and indeed he plays rook D8. Yeah, well, if, he, if he had a half an hour more, he could invest 10 minutes staring in that position, looking for complications. But when you already are down, you don't want to potentially waste that time uh, because very likely you find nothing after knight a4. You very likely refute the cd4 idea, which is a little bit wicked, um, which probably doesn't work. Very often I have this in my own games as well. I see an idea like that and I don't even actually, I don't manage to refute it, but I just don't trust it and I just don't go for it, uh, which is of course always, um, always a pity because, you know, you want to know why you take certain decisions, but sometimes you just have to rely on your intuition as well and... Uh, Dink, looking at his own clock, being half an hour down, plays a solid option of rook d8. Now it's on Jan to, to prove a, the small advantage that he might potentially have here. And it's on Jan also to avoid the tempting knight a4, which runs into knight c7. So presumably, Jan, who is chilling in the break room right now, will invest a little bit of time to figure out the proper regrouping, where to put his queen, whether uh, to put the knight on e2 to g3. A lot of questions to be answered for both players. Jan's got more time to answer them. He's up 30 minutes on the clock as Ding, making sure to stay hydrated. And we will also stay hydrated, and we will do that by taking a break. Ladies and gentlemen, you are watching Game 3 of the 2023 FIDE World Championship. We hope you're enjoying our coverage, and we will be back with more action from Ding Nepo in just a couple of short minutes. Hi, I'm Gotham Chess, and this is the Chess Kid Chessboard Challenge. I just stab myself. Ah. Can I take two at the same time? <laughs> okay, they'll just edit that out. Ah. Ah. I think the world record is like 35 seconds or something. Yeah. I still know how to do this. Yeah. Uh, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Did I just get a world record? That was like 32 seconds. <laughs> Welcome into our new video lecture series here with the one and only, the 14th World Chess Champion, Vishwanathan Anand. If you have to explain that you're world champion and it's taking longer than two words, there's something wrong with your title. And that's how I felt <laughs> at this there's point. There's something wrong with But I believe in, when we're talking the 60s and 70s, even the 80s and 90s, you could see that the match format produced something unique. And I remember there was a funny moment at the press conference where uh, I was trying to tone it down, uh, not get very excited, and also I had not had time to collect myself. In fact, I already wanted to calm down and think of the next game because I knew this is a wounded animal there. I knew that I had to play a game against a man who was desperate for the match to be over so that he could clinch his title. He, he wanted a draw at any price. I mean, you can make a joke that um, he had spent a week out of the swimming pool already, so he must have been exhausted and waiting to finish the match. <laughs> so for all of us, there was this feeling of um, we got to grab this chance with both hands because it's not going to come by way.
What is a chess dynasty? Unceasing dominance, move after move, again and again and again. We have a oh. resignation, we have history. He is the five-time FIDE world chess champion. But a chess dynasty can also be cruel. It forces most to defer their dreams until next time. If there is a next time. It's losing. Oh my God, did he just blow? Yeah, he did. I'm blown away. The game is over. As the chess world turns to Kazakhstan, the Magnus Carlsen dynasty is set to close. The FIDE World Championship is finally up for grabs. For two chess superstars lying in wait, until next time is now. Jan Nepomneshi has methodically done what he needed to do to get another shot at the title. The pressure to seize the moment this time rests heavily upon him. Jan Nepomneshi, first World Championship victory in game two. This has to be such an amazing feeling. Ding Li Ren knows firsthand what the end of this dynasty means. An unexpected chance to make history. Can China's best turn his good fortune into eternal fame? Whoa! What? Have you seen this move before? What's happening? He has to definitely find the momentum and recompose himself. The legacy of this championship spans across centuries. It reads from the names of chess giants. For the first time in a decade, a new name will raise the trophy and be etched into chess history. It's the 2023 FIDE World Championship. Whose name will next be called champion? Welcome back to chess.com's coverage of the 2023 FIDE World Championship. We are an hour and 48 minutes into game three of this momentous and prestigious event. It's been a pleasure bringing you coverage alongside Grandmaster Anish Giri and, of course, Grandmaster David Howell. It's been awesome, and the game is just heating up. We are 20 moves in, and Yana Pomnishi has just made a very big decision. So let's jump right into the game. D takes C5 has been played, releasing the tension in the center. Ding is recaptured with the queen, and queen to d2. Anish, I'll start with you. Is this an attempt to bail out, or is Jan playing more ambitiously than it looks? Yeah, Danny, you just mentioned, uh, you just called it heating up. I think we are about to see it cooling down. I mean, after d4, <laughs> after d4, I don't, I don't see d4, ed, knight, d4, knight, d4, rook, d4. I mean, Roll. once you trick d pawn for e pawn, you reach symmetry. And... I don't think it's strange. I mean, you guys were enthusiastic for white for a while, and I, I can understand that. I'm, of course, traumatized by that easy draw that Ding reached against me in this structure. I believe that uh, these positions, they're simply not, uh, they're not too promising for white with the pawn on f3. I understand if I had a pawn on f2, I could uh, circle around the d5 pawn forever. And these positions, I uh, have different kind of experiences. But when white has a pawn on f3, and the e3 pawn is constantly weak, it's really hard to... Uh, to get yourself to ever exploit the weak d5 pawn. And that is probably one of the reasons why Jan doesn't even bother and allows the allows d4. I believe in general, he was caught somewhat off guard. He was hoping for Ding to play the Nimso defense, where he had some surely uh, more exciting ideas. But he was caught somewhat off guard, misremembered his prep. And at this point, he is happy to just um, offer a path... Um, a path uh, to a draw to Dink, and uh, don't forget he is up half a point. There's no need to take any risks. So I expect actually the game to cool down rather than heat up. But maybe I'm missing something after d4. Let's see. What do you think, David? Uh, that's the first move we calculate, right? It's a forcing move. Um, it simplifies the matter. Uh, let's dive in. Let's uh, check out. Uh, are we missing anything? Okay, I'm assuming a capture, another capture. You no, have to you take. Much have to takes and after queen f2 uh bishop to e luckily there is no rookie a check knight on f6 guards that after bishop e6 we just have to make sure that white cannot exploit the pin uh between the queen and the x-ray rather oh you see the he can oh. exploit i think rook d1 and knight e2 mm -hmm. that's what i was that's what i was worried that's what i was worried and rook a d8 knight yeah. e2 mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sharp so instead of bishop e6 i have to make another move perhaps 
because uh, I do have, maybe I should play queen d6 and pinning, but then you grab the d4 with rook d1. So let, let me see if I have a if I have a good move here. B6. Yeah, there's you also queen takes d4, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, you could see why black might get slightly scared here. Uh... Yeah, sorry, queen takes d4 move earlier. Let's, let's take a look. Yeah, the pin, of course, slightly. Let's take a look at queen takes d4, yeah, of course. Queen takes queen. Yeah, yeah. why did I take with the rook? Of course, take with the queen, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. rookie seven to maybe try to <laughs> try to exploit uh, something, uh, get get a little bit active, but uh, this is not your usual seventh rank situation. Uh, once I get my bishop on e six, you will mm -hmm. uh, yeah you, you will not be able to to touch me. I guess I guess bishop there's seven. One, yeah, there's one active mm -hmm. rook. Oh, there there is some small potential for white if. After bishop d7, let's say even if we trade everything, that you have a little bit of a weak soft a5 pawn. I have some d files, or this maybe is small pressure for white, especially because uh, the fact that my rook is more active and your pawn on a5 is a bit weak. So maybe bishop d7 allows small plus, though. Yeah, even here the bar is convinced this is all right. I guess you quickly do some knight d5, knight c4, followed by rook c8, quick counterplay against the queen side pawns. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in the starting position that we have now in the lifeboard uh, position, I can also play bishop d7. Let's let's say I don't force the matters. I don't think this is much either, to be very honest. Hmm. Yeah, it's so unclear it's, whether the d5 pawn is actually weaker than the e3 pawn anyway. And uh, if white needs to jump in with knight d4 at some point, the structure will just become symmetrical uh, without black needing to force that issue. So, yes, um... and especially I believe if we uh, if we get to trade queens. As white, mm -hmm. probably the d5 pawn is weaker because you can play king f2, defending the e3 pawn with the king. But what happened in my game with Ding is that we never traded queens. And at some point, I, I remember I actually even played king f2 with the queens on the board. But then uh, he hit me uh, on the diagonal with like move like a queen c7 at some point. And somewhere he pushed the pawn to h5. And I remember I started getting nervous about my king there. So I think in this kind of positions, black has to keep the queens on the board. And if uh, he manages to do so, I think the pawns are, well, I would still feel d5 might be a little weaker, but maybe they are uh, more or less equally weak. So yes, a choice for Ding. Um, I have to say it's very tempting to go d4 and uh, get rid of your weakness. But uh, even if not, I think uh, position is very close to be more or less completely balanced and white's advantage, if anything, is just very symbolic. Yeah. What decision do you think uh, would most suit Ding right now in the match situation, the way he's been feeling? Uh, which one would suit his style more? Suffer slightly, potentially, with bishop d7? What, if not suffer, at least prolong the tension, uh, keep the game going, or mm. uh, try and solve it here and now, mathematically, with d4? Um, Anish, you might differ on this. I, I feel like d4 is... I, I don't want to say d4 is a must, I, but I feel like d4 is the most concrete way to solve problems. Bishop d7, to me, intuitively feels... Bishop takes d7 and knight d4. I, I don't see the upside. And I feel like d4 just decides things. He does play bishop d7. So he waited for me to say this, as usual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, Dania, I, I think the reason me, uh, the reason me, you, David, and Ding, we, we have like two different opinions. So there is you and uh, David, who clearly feel that white is some pressure if, if, you know, if we keep the status quo. But me and Dink, we are maybe influenced by the game that uh, we had against each other. <laughs> and that game, I I was not pressing at all. Like, I really got nowhere. If anything, at some point, I was already happy it was all over because I was also playing very slowly. So I think that uh, me and Dink, we are under the influence of that game. And we feel that if the position just remains neutral, if uh, nothing happens, then Black is just very comfortable. And I don't know which which camp is more right, you, um, Daniel, and uh, David, or me and Ding. Uh, which camp? Maybe we are too biased with with Ding. Maybe uh, that game, you know, uh, confused both of us. And White is actually slightly better. But uh, whatever it is, I'm sure Ding saw D4. I'm sure he he saw he could probably hold it. But I think he thought that that position is slightly worse, and uh, he thinks that this one is just fine. It's just fine, and uh, it will it will be up to Jan to show uh, who is right here, uh, whether Jan will put any pressure here. I honestly uh, don't think this kind of position suits Jan. I don't think he has a lot of experience playing 
against isolated queenside pawns. Uh, he plays one e4. The pawn is never on e3. It's already on e4 after move one. So uh, I don't I don't see why he would uh, why he would uh, be an expert in this pawn structure. With black, he's also played the greenfield his entire life. He never faced these kind of positions. While Ding has a lot more experience with these structures, I think Ding will easily um, easily hold this game today. Uh, at the same time, I don't think he will get active counter chances because if white plays it carefully, um, there is just no way for black to take over. So I do expect, basically, I, I think Jan is not too ambitious here. I think he does understand the position very well, and I think he just thinks it looks quite equal. And uh, yeah, I think we, we are uh, going to see a solid game uh, from now on. And Daniel Anish, Anish is dish, dissing us here. He's uh, showing us why we're not top 10 in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is the more Anish uh, shares his insights on the position, the more I realize that the E3 pawn is just such a... Devastating is the wrong word. It's not a devastating weakness. It's a long-term weakness. And it really, it, it saddles you because you just... Okay, you put a knight on D4. And I always feel like this happens even in Blitz games when I play very good players against an IQPO put a knight on d4 because that's what I was taught. And then I just reach a dead end because the d5 pawn, it's isolated, but it's simultaneously very, very well defended. The other reason I thought white might have a minuscule iota of an advantage is again that b5 square, the a4 square. There's a slightly weak square complex on the queen side. So I could envision a scenario where white, let's say takes on d7 and plays knight d4 and then maybe goes rook e1 to c1. And the last thing I'll point out, and David, I'll pass it back to you, is that after knight takes d4, e takes d4, I think it's easy to be fooled by the symmetry of the structure, but that pawn on f3, as one Robert Hess would be quick to point out, is fully restricting the mobility of the knight. White could stick a rook on e5. Even this, I think, is closer to equality than to anything else. Maybe black and pressure the d4 pawn, but still, I would prefer white here. If I, if I had to choose a side, I would definitely take white. Your thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I would take white here, but it is a stylistic thing. I do recognize that if we backtrack to this position, there's maybe two ways of equalizing. Um, this one is more direct. Uh, I think maybe just uh, because I'm always in time trouble, I want to resolve the tension. I want to kind of force the issue. I want to calculate my way to the end goal, which I guess here for black is equality, whereas bishop d7 is a karma move where players trust the fact that actually the position is dynamically balanced anyway. If any problems arise later, they will be solvable. So, um, yeah, I'm not saying either move is better than the other, but uh, yeah, just a matter of taste. So uh, Ding does, in the end, go for bishop d7, and we're yet to see a reaction. Um, I do expect, as you mentioned, uh, Daniel, Daniel, maybe just to either trade bishops or maybe jump in first with the knight to d4. I'm not sure if there's a big difference. Um, I was wondering initially whether, for example, after a trade, whether I could slide across and only put a knight on d4 when you can take back with a piece. But this does give black a very important tempo. Um, I'm wondering how to use that. Maybe this uh, kind of counterplay we mentioned earlier starts coming in at some point. Um, either way, Jan has choices. He has options in the current position. Yes, I think uh, I like knight d4 first, because if you do take on d4, e d4, and you make a move like queen d6, and these kind of positions, I, I think especially when we keep light squared bishops on the board, and I get bishop on d3, they could be a little better for white. But I do also wonder... Uh, if it's not an optical illusion, because the thing about this queen side, I understand uh, what Daniel mentioned, and I also thought at first when I had that game that you know he also has also has a weakness on b5. But the thing is, when Black at some point will prepare this b5 push, once I get b5 before, I will have a strength, not a weakness. And at the same time, if you prevent it with a4, then you will have a weakness on b4, which is uh, at the very least as important, if not more. So. I think it could be somewhat of an optical illusion that black is worse in a position like this. Because this weakness of b5, it's it's not exactly a weakness. And we see Jan trading the bishops, uh, the le less ambitious uh, way to, to go. And after rook d7, rook d1, b5 comes to mind. Also, uh, a move like rook to e8 comes to mind as well, when uh, after knight d4, you have, to, uh, yeah, you have to constantly worry about your e3 pawn. Oh, he took with an what? Knight. Took with a knight. Wow. What? So very. Strange. I guess he wants ah. ninety-five. He wants ninety-five knight c four. Oh yeah. Ooh, spicy. Really spicy. Oh, the the bar likes it a lot, by the way. The bar is a little bit. 
Bar is a little bit down. It's a little bit like liking black here or what? Yeah. Whoa. Getting active. Was Bishop takes Was Bishop takes Bishop in an accuracy? Wow. Unexpected. Oh. Jan completely missed this move. Look at Jan. He's uh, he's getting into the closer to the board. He missed it. Okay, what if knight d4 though? I don't I, how can white be worse though? I mean knight d4? Why should I be worse? It doesn't look worse at all. Knight e5. Yes. Mm -hmm. Knight e6 fe, you want to be better there? Why not? We're gonna have a monster knight on c4. I don't know. Your I don't like the structure with the soft pawn on e6, uh, weak square on g6 as well. It looks soft to me. Uh, I have all these uh, old games of, of course, in these old games of Kar Kasparov Karpov, White had a light squared mm. bishop, which was exploiting it. So I, I understand where you're coming from. But I wouldn't allow knight takes e6 as black, but it's also possible. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think the position, yeah, I, I'm very surprised that the bar would say that black is, uh, black is better. I think that is overstating it. Uh, certainly the players don't feel this way after knight d4. I think they would think that the position is around equal. But a very good showing of good show of alertness there by Ding with Knight takes the seventh. He showed that you know he's also he played quickly. He showed that he is tactically alert and uh, Knight takes d5 is an illusion of a threat. It's not really a threat because of Knight b6. I assume maybe just winning. Am I winning a piece there actually? Looks that way. Pin on the d file. Yeah, queen d5. Um... There is Queen takes e3 at the very least. So Knight d7 is clever uh, indeed. After Rook d7, the Knight on f6 was a problem piece. Uh, even what you mentioned after knight d4, knight d4, ed, the position is not too bad, but the knight on f6 is uh, dominated by the f3 pawn. So knight takes d7, very clever. Now Jan is uh, wrapping his, uh, his uh, you know, forehead with, with his hands, thinking deeply about, uh, about the consequences of, what, of his last decision. And after knight d4, I think knight d4 should come, because otherwise knight e5 or knight b6 heading to c4 could really become a problem. I think it's time to... Uh, uh, offer symmetry with knight d4 and ask black whether uh, whether black wants to take some significant risks or just take on d4, going for position that uh, looks pretty equal. Well, knight takes d7. That was a statement move by Ding Liren. The retreating knight moves. We talked about them in a different context. Um, Ding, turning on computer mode. Well, speaking of computers, preparation as a whole for the World Championship has greatly evolved with the advent of computer chess. And Nepo has risen to prominence uh, in, you know, the sort of first computer generation. I sat down with Jan a couple months ago and asked him how these lines affect the way that he plays. Let's listen in to Jan Nepomnishi. I wouldn't say uh, I'm like someone who could call himself like uh, a child of, you know, computer era. I think uh, maybe I'm... Still, still belong to you know to let's say more or less okay this mixed generation yeah who's who started actually playing just without computers but okay later on after achieving some level already you can't you can't really think of playing just without like checking lines and uh, you know actually right now you can just check lines with your with your iPhone yeah so that's uh, that's probably enough to to find uh, the moment of, you know when you blundered but for me it was main mostly about like checking the database and uh, learning some games and getting some info about the openings, uh, especially for the first time. And uh, of course, like now it's, I don't know. So maybe most of the players, they're just trying to play like computers already because, okay, it's uh, by far the most effective uh, way. And whenever you just see the computer lines, whenever you see the evaluations, you, I mean, I don't know about, okay, everyone, but okay, as for me, uh, I'm trying to understand why is that. So that's why you try to dig in deeper into the lines. It's not necessarily, you're not necessarily learning uh, the evaluation, but you want to see the typical maneuvers and so on. So that's because normally before you would like replay some games of great players and see how do they play, how do they manage, okay, this or that piece. But now you just do the same with, you know, the first line of the engine yeah, or the second line. Jan Apomnishi on his use of computers and uh where computer preparation figures in his overall world championship preparation. We pulled up a matchup card there. Nepo and Ding are from the same generation. Ding is 30, Nepo is 32. And that's the generation which grew up having computers, but not having strong chess engines really until they were maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20. That's when, you know, computers essentially became unbeatable. So I want to get your guys' take on uh, what Nepo had to say about 
computers. Um, Anish, do you feel like at this point, people from Nepo's generation are fully 100% reliant on computers? Or if you compare someone like Nepo with someone like Arjun Aragaisi, for example, uh, would you say that someone like Arjun is substantively more reliant on engines than someone from an older generation uh, like Nepo? Anish, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, it's one of my favorite topics, Dania. So, you know, you've um, uh, unleashed, uh, you know, uh, unleashed the <laughs> monster. There. I, I love uh, talking about the influence of computers on um, players and on players of different generations. I was thinking about it recently when I had a game with one of the young players. And at some point I realized that this young player is, he has a very similar thinking process to mine. And I thought, well, how is that possible? We've grew up such different times and why, why are we so similar? And then I realized that maybe it's not so much the generational uh, difference because you have to realize that a lot of young players, they're getting lots of coaching. They're reading lots of books. They're recommended to read books uh, and they still read the same books, you know, about the uh, games of Capablanca, or Alöken, of uh, uh, Kasparov, Fischer, Tal. And um, whether you are from the old generation or from the young generation, you still uh, are influenced uh, very often by old-fashioned old old-fashioned uh, ways of uh, learning chess, uh, books and games. And so I'm not sure about, for example, Arjun in particular. Uh, I have the feeling Arjun is mainly uh, shaped as a player by playing online Blitz a lot. You know it better because you are, you, okay, as we know, you are the, the boss the, the boss of chess.com now, the, the, big, uh, the big number one across uh, both time controls. So uh, you know it better. But I have a feeling that Arjun played a lot as a young, as a young player online. I'm not sure he spent a lot of time with the engine, actually. Gukesh fa famously hasn't spent much time with the engine at all. What has he been doing instead? I guess he's been reading books and studying uh, games of players. While uh, me, myself, Fabiano and Wesley, we are much older than Gukesh, but we must have spent a lot more, a lot more time um, with the engine. So I'm not sure there is a generational shift there. I think it would be very interesting, just like at some point, uh, the DeepMind team decided to build an engine that is free of the human games and of human nonsense to build a, to create a player who would uh, not learn any classical games, who would not uh, watch any human games, but would just learn from the engine and see how strong that human player would become. But we are so far, um, we are not there. Nobody does it. As soon as a young player is talented, he immediately gets coached by some old guy uh, like a uh, great Vladimir Kramnik or Boris Gelfand who tell the, these young guys that, okay, you know, you have to know your classics and we, we ruin this uh, pure experiment. And, uh, and, and in the end, everybody ends up studying the same classical games. So I'm uh, curious what uh, David's thoughts are on this topic, but I, I, don't, I don't know if there's any gen generational difference there per se. Yeah, I'm uh, inclined to agree in general, Anish. I think uh, the kind of the young players who do rise to the top from this kind of younger generation, they have a quite a broad um, education anyway. They do have easier access to resources than uh, previous generations, for example, and they know to do the right things. They're given good advice. But I do think that uh, the young generation who have grown up uh, with stockfish available, for example, there are more pitfalls. I know a lot of youngsters who get carried away, away by evalu evaluations. They see a position, they say, okay, this looks like plus one, this looks like plus two, but actually their own understanding doesn't improve. Um, they're just try trying to rely on memorization. They're trying to rely on kind of tactics that the computer shows uh, without kind of explaining it to themselves. And yeah, I grew up in the same generation as Jan, as Magnus, as all these guys, of course. And um, I'm looking back and I've analyzed some of our childhood games. Our openings were terrible compared to uh, the kind of young generation nowadays, partly due to the effect of Chessable. Uh, but I think we learned from our own mistakes. We learned from uh, kind of we learned a lot about our own style styles and preferences and and so on quite early on, and uh, that definitely helps. And uh, I don't think it's a, uh, kind of coincidence that, for example, Magnus, Sergey Karyakin, uh, Fabiano Caruana, and uh, Jan now all and Ding all from the same generation and all still up there despite the emergence of the youngsters. Um, so. I'm terrible still using technology. I'm uh, unlike you, Anish. I really don't uh, enjoy analyzing with computers too much. Um, I try to play anti-computer chess these days uh, just to avoid my opening uh, my opponent's preparation. But yeah, if the young players use them well, then uh, definitely a great tool to have. And it has influenced 
kind of Yan in recent years, he's made this big push since his openings got better, since uh, I think he's figured out how to use these new tools at his disposal. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, he's, uh, he's up against Ding, who I guess grew up a couple of years younger. Maybe engines played more of a role in his development, but uh, still, uh, he has the human touch. He's uh, clearly got that solid style that he's developed himself over the years. Totally co-sign your point, David, earlier about uh, just the state of openings, which isn't great now for me, but looking at my games from, you know, 2005, 2006, uh, man, I mean, <laughs> like three or four moves of theory and then we're completely on our own. But recently I was in a bit of a historical tangent, um, realizing that it would be a mistake to say that openings, you know, were not taken seriously in the pre-computer era. I was surfing through uh, Mikhail Chagorin, who was a uh, top uh, Russian player before. Uh, the emergence of the Soviet Union from the late 1800s, he published the first Russian language chess magazine. And in that magazine, in every issue, he had an opening analysis section, uh, which he did himself. And it would usually be 15 to 20 pages of, of variations that resemble a modern opening book. And you think about how much time that took to produce without, you know, without anything, just he's sitting there with a board and, you know, a, a paper and a pen. And he's writing up all this crazy analysis on the King's Gambit and the lines are going up to, you know, move 20. So the approach was serious, but now the volume of information that has to be consumed has exponentially risen with chessable and engines. And of course, the objective value of all that analysis is much, much higher now with, with engines confirming everything. And as we've been talking, Nepo has made a decision, uh, Anish, and it is in fact knight d4 and dang, wasting no time responding with knight b6. Computer, computer. It's the first line of the engine. And uh, well, I had this small uh, moment of bias at first because, you know, I don't like this pawn e6 and pawn on h6. But as I mentioned, white doesn't have light squared bishop, so I changed my mind completely. Knight e6, f6. Knight c4 is coming. Knight b6 is even better than knight on e5 for some, okay, for obvious reasons. Knight is less vulnerable there, and also it uh, keeps an eye on the a4 square. You know what could happen here? Because I see the bar already favoring black. I can easily imagine that Jan uh, would be completely oblivious to the dangers here. I know Jan is a very optimistic player. Even I myself, I wouldn't necessarily realize that I can already be slightly worse. I couldn't, I would think, why am I slightly worse? Well, how, how? I mean, what, why, why were we slightly worse? So especially if Jan is not aware of the dangers here, yet he sees knight c4 coming, you know, he, could could backfire for Jan. I mean, I could easily see it going wrong. And there are some concrete threats to the white queen side. After knight c4, the queen side is quite vulnerable. And Ding playing quickly and confidently, the clock situation also evening out. You know, today could could be a good day for Ding Liren. Let's see. Yeah, but if Jan wants to pull the brakes, uh, he did kind of grimace slightly before he left the board. Uh, if he wants to pull the brakes, it feels like there must be a way, right? Uh, should we try and figure out a path to safety for white? So Jan, Jan made that face with knight d4, uh, sort of like, okay, fine, draw, you know? But where is the draw? Where is the draw? Now, okay, he, he was sort of implying, like, okay, I, was, I thought I'm better, but it's fine. Now I'll give you the draw. Okay, yeah. how do you, <laughs> no, no, not give, how do you get the draw? I, I don't see, so it's a good question. So breaks indeed. I don't see... Um, I'm not saying white is losing, no, no, but in terms of breaks, I don't see the breaks. I don't see how to simplify the position further. I just don't see it. Uh, we cannot trade the e-pawn for d-pawn anymore. After knight e6, f6, we cannot trade the queens uh, so easily. Maybe queen d4, but is that really breaks or is it just going for a slightly worse endgame after rook c8, takes takes and knight coming to c4? So I'm, I don't think there are there is a way for white to force a draw at this point. But I guess just playing reasonable moves should still be solid enough uh, to maintain some sort of equilibrium. But the computer evaluation, you know, the, the computers are good, as we discussed already. If they say Black's better, I mean, Black's better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. David, I don't know what lines are circling in your head. Just really quickly, I'll share the line that keeps circling around in my mind, which is if you go Rook D1, after Knight C4, Queen F2, I think Knight takes A3 is mighty annoying because knight a4 looks like a clever move oh let's counterattack the queen but no queen before and black maintains the extra pawn so 
that's one way that White could very easily dig himself into an objective hole. Now you'll be down a pawn. Uh, and, and there's other lines that are problematic as well. Yeah, plenty of other lines. Uh, Rook D1 looks like a stabilizing move, but actually it does weaken E3 as well. So some tactics there potentially. Yeah, I'm on the same page as Anisha. I just don't see a way uh, to kind of go into reverse gear and say, okay, let's equalize, let's draw this one. I think the uh, this problem is, is concrete. Threat. Is concrete. I think if I um, had the knight on e2 already, let's say knight c2, I would probably be slightly better. But uh, I think the problem is that after knight c4, mm -hmm. um, it's just there's just no comfortable comfortable move. And uh, I I would still try to take on e6 first uh, to try to try to create some weaknesses in black's position instead. I was looking at knight e6, f6. And now maybe now knight e2, but then again after knight c4, I was trying to make some queen d4 perhaps work. Yeah, but knight e2 makes no sense then, even rook c8. So yeah, I I, I, I don't see after knight e6, f6, how to deal with the threat of knight c4 or knight a3 in a way that is uh, prideful. I mean, of course, I can play even a move like knight b1. I dealt with that threat. It's not a, it's not a, pro, a question of how to save the pawn. It's a question of how to save the pawn while keeping the pieces on good squares. And that is a harder task. Yeah. How bad is this endgame you mentioned trying to get rid of the queens? Um, yeah, maybe that's the least uh, the least of uh, the evils. Maybe rook a c8 or? Mm -hmm. Does white? Well, I don't know if white can keep the queens on anymore. Um, I was thinking of going to try and pressure these pawns, but it's just a one move threat. Yeah, and you know, the thing about endgames is that once you enter an endgame, then the weakness of the e6 and g6 squares, while not relevant anyway, uh, without the queens, it is not an issue at all, because this is a minor weakening of the king side and of the king's safety. And so once the queens are off, it already becomes clear that this, this is already visibly better for black. Here, I can already see it because, of course, the fact that knight c4 is coming is, um, is an issue in an endgame. And the fact that the King side is somewhat weakened, is irrelevant completely. So I would somehow keep the queens on the board as white to sort of, you know, when you are slightly worse, there are two types of slightly worse. There's a slightly worse where it's visible to everyone that you're slightly worse. And there is a slightly worse where it's kind of a dynamic slightly worse. So you have trumps, he has trumps, but your trumps are less than his trumps. But when you have this kind of slightly worse, the opponent might not even realize that he's better because he might assess your trumps as bigger than his or equal to his. And so you might um, get away with, uh, you know, with something this way. So when you're slightly worse, at first you try to not make it obvious that you are slightly worse, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? And until, until at some point the opponent plays so well, sooner or later you have to transition into a worse endgame, something like that. Yeah. That was a lot of trumps you mentioned there, Anish. <laughs> but uh, yeah, difficult position uh, for White either way. And it, in terms of talking about small disadvantages, it's not really Yan's style to suffer in one of those uh, kind of let's get the queens off and try and grovel type of disadvantages. It would be very much his style to, okay, be worse, but at least look, the counter chances keep some uh, tension. And I think we're struggling to find those types of positions either. And uh, so is he, judging by his clock usage over the last few moves. Um, maybe it's starting it's to settle common, in now. Common, uh, of course, common theme that the pawns a3, b2 are hit by knight c4. Because if the a3 pawn was on a2, I would be able to re respond with b3, kicking the knight away. But now mm -hmm. after b3, the a3 pawn is hanging. So white ended up in the situation uh, because of these pawns. And you know, it's quite interesting that we were talking about the weakness of the b5 square, which was apparent, but it now turned around on white. Suddenly white's pawn, queen side pawns are, are weak. And... Uh, yeah, it, it is just uh, remarkable how complicated chess can be sometimes that, I mean, in a position which looks slightly better for white at the start, right? You guys were saying white slightly better. Uh, I warned you, of course, but you didn't listen. And uh, <laughs> now we are on the defensive, you know? But That's I why would... you're welcome to six and ish. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that I think if Jan finds like one or two, I was thinking about the move rookie two, you know, one or two solid, calm defensive moves. It still feels like he should be well within the general range of equality. Um, so I was thinking rookie two, knight c4, queen d3. Oh, two, yes. And then it's very important, I think, that knight takes e3 fails. 
to knight takes e6, hitting the sort of the tail of the discovery. And then you take the knight with, with the queen. Um, so if that doesn't work, then perhaps white could potentially bring the other rook over to d1 and solidify that knight. And if you can get black to take on d4, okay, black maybe has a tiny pull because of the superior knight, but that is something I think Nepo would be more than happy to, to finish off defending. Yeah, I liked rook e2 as well. But uh, here, uh, what if rook ac8 after queen d3? I, I don't think I want to take on d4. I think that will ease in your... Uh... You'll open a bunch of files. So here, how do you deal with the threat of knight b2 right now? Mm -hmm. Well, knight b2. Is knight b2 really if rook d1? Uh, okay. Knight a3. okay, it's also knight a4. Yeah, but knight a3, see. knight a4, okay. yeah. Well, make a move anyway. Make a move. Okay, rook d1. Rook d1. Okay. Ah, knight b2. You are you are claiming that we'll just. Well, I want well, knight I f5 and pull. rook d5. Hmm. In this position, done. Yeah, go a little take bit, maybe. everything. And I was thinking, well, rook b7, I thought first, maybe, but but yeah, knight of 5 2. I agree. Black white is suffering for sure. No question about it. Well, yeah, well, something like this is, of course, possible and maybe good. And this is probably how white should play, trying to seek for a seek a draw in these kind of complications. But obviously, here, uh, I mean, obviously, black is slightly better. It's just a question is if. Uh, if it's a draw or if there is something more to it. I mean, uh, black is moment, at the moment um, a pawn up, even though a bunch of pawns are weak. It's only black that plays for advantage. But yeah, something like this, I guess, is the way to play. Just keep, put rooks uh, on good positions, rook e2, rook d1, allow us at some point knight b 2 and try to salvage a uh, salvage a draw there. Um, that that's, that's sounds right about right to me. Much better than the approach of going like knight d1 and trying to uh, go everything back and try to defend because that that's how you really get into trouble mm -hmm. active defense yeah makes sense uh i was also wondering about kind of using these squares um yeah. sorry so five is the most five perhaps the most natural yeah. move now i realized yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. this was the first move on my radar just to kind of connect these knights and hope that the white queen covers it covers the rest of the mess covers all the pawns, but again, it might be slightly uncomfortable. Uh, for example, if black kind of cements at some point the knight on c4, you're still a bit stuck with white. It's unclear you ever want to resolve the tension. And um, yeah, I could imagine this one being uh, kind of at least psychologically or aesthetically difficult for Jan to go for. And look at this beautiful uh, knight position. on c4. Uh, actually, even if I take on d4 and go b5, the knight on c4, it hits that weak e3 pawn, it hits the weak b2 pawn, uh, and it's so, so well protected there. Uh, and here we could definitely say that probably white has more weaknesses than black and the d5 pawn is no longer under any pressure. With the knight on c4, I am exerting a lot of pressure on the e3 pawn and keeping b2 pawn in check. I, I think this is nice for, for uh, black. And that even said, I don't even have to take on d4 yet, uh, keeping, you know, keeping white knights, white knights attack, attached to each other. Uh, making it hard for white uh, to move. So not a very pleasant scenario. I, I think this rookie 2 rookie one idea, trying to bail out in a slightly worse endgame, that is the more class, classy approach uh, to try and make a draw in a position like this. Let's see if that's what Jan chooses. Because knight cb5 is a more prideful way. You try to um, you try to keep the isolated pawn blocked. You you know you don't admit that you are worse. But, uh, but when you are worse, maybe it's, it's okay to admit it as well, yeah. Yeah, difficult decision. Yeah, difficult decision, and it's not Jan's style to play a move like rookie two, uh, really, but uh, he might have to. Let's see if he goes for it. And the clocks are balanced out. Okay, he plays rook d1. We mentioned this earlier, and Daniel pointed out that black could potentially win a pawn in some lines. Uh, what do we think mm -hmm. of this move? This is... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is going to happen. Yep. Only a logical move, really. Uh, the white right, maybe, queen... maybe he wants queen c1. But that's very mm -hmm. passive. This comes in the way of the C file. I'll bring the rook to C8, put pressure there. Yeah. I don't like no, no, I think I think queen to E2 or F2. And after knight A3, he has he has a way to he thinks he has a way to somehow simply Maybe knight F5? Or... Oh, in okay, we'll find out, Daniel. Uh knight <laughs> C4. Oh, take on D5, yeah, yeah. So let's say queen F2, yeah, in that case. Mm -hmm. Let's put it on the board. And uh, if we take this pawn, trying to undermine this knight on c3, then you want knight f5. Wow. Or not. Interesting. 
Eva Bard. Yeah. Is like, <laughs> that's the important thing. <laughs> yeah. It's very yeah, human, yeah. though, going for some checks. Wow. Well. <laughs> I don't think knight d5 for uh, cheap up. This is nice, knight d5, mm -hmm. but maybe king h8. Yeah, just to show oh, the I tactic. Have, uh, I have another crazy idea after after we finish with this. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is the tactic. This is what white wants. Uh, what's the crazy idea, Daniel? Hit us with to it. To play e e4 instead of knight f5. I'm sure the evil bar Ooh. will laugh. Oh, oh sure, I like oh. that. Oh, I like <laughs> all right. So many captures now. It's so tricky to calculate. Uh, what should black even try here? <laughs> Comes with a complimentary Advil. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess uh, uh, I guess we should simplify as black. Yeah, maybe knight takes d4 simply. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're heading in this direction. Queen, queen d4. Knight e3, four. Or queen d4. Or, or, or yeah, I was going to just take knight d2 and uh, get an equal end game, pretty much. Yeah, okay, if anyone, I think black is slightly better, knight e3, let's say, or, but I, I don't think it's much. Yeah, and the game goes on. Um, so this is the current position uh, after queen to f2. I didn't have to take Any on options? a3, by the way. Just mm -hmm. make, a, make a move. Just rook c8 to make take. sense. Tempting to take, of course, I have to say. Mm -hmm. This is what we expected, right? Jan defending actively with uh, the help of tactics. Yeah, this is the this knight a3 e4. This is the kind of approach you should take in a position like this, and then just uh, try try and hope to simplify everything and make the game peter uh, into a draw. Uh, let's see if Dink has really any sensible alternatives to knight a3 here. What is White's next move? If let's say rook a c8, yeah, is the one you suggested. Mm -hmm. Good question. Hmm. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about e4 anyway. It doesn't seem to work there because the knight is targeting b2. So knight f5, we already discussed, but that's a one-move threat. Black can move his king to h7, for example, and what have, what is white accomplished? Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. It's a bit loose uh, on f5, subtle, the knight as well. Subtle position uh, here, very subtle position. Very unclear. Um... After rook a knight, knight a4, by the way, is also some kind of move. The queen doesn't have that many squares, but maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know. Knight, knight, I kind of, the knight on a4 is, of course, not well placed, but maybe I am misplacing your queen somewhat. Maybe. Not not so sure. Did they not teach you any knights on the side of the board, knights in the room? Yeah, no, you know, one time I, uh, it was when I was working with Vladimir Kramnik uh, before his candidate tournament in 2018. I had lost once a very painful game to Levon, and early on I played knight a5 with black, and he just sent me a short message. He said, like, uh, he said, you know, knights, uh, knights on the rim, like knight on the rim is dim or something. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm uh, trying, to be, trying to be top players here, you know, trying to play, uh, trying to think deep stuff, and Vladimir Kramnik just tells me, you know, don't put in the horse at the edge of the board. <laughs> but anyway, sometimes, yeah, and you know, you have to take the L, as they say. Yeah. It's conventional wisdom for a reason, I guess. But uh, yeah. <laughs> very conventional. Very Here it might work. <laughs> Ninety three, very tempting. I mean, when you have a tactical opportunity that that is where you don't risk anything as well, uh, because mm -hmm. I don't think black risks in any of the variations. It's very hard to resist it mm -hmm. because you think, okay, if I don't do it now, maybe I'll never get this opportunity. And also, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, if White finds some draw in some end rook end game, some end game, that's uh, fine by me as well. How, how how big a deal it is. So I think knight a3 are yeah, very likely uh, very likely to to follow. Um, I don't know. Also from the possible moves, I mean, I can play a4, uh, trying to you know cement cement something. I like the look Maybe of that then, one. Just yeah, control. Yeah, just trying to. What I don't like slightly is I, I wish I could also go b5, so I cannot follow it up with b5. But maybe a4 alone is uh, uh, a4 alone is uh, good enough, mm -hmm. and, and sort of give white a move and ask because now after a4 I suspect knight a3 maybe is a bigger bigger threat than before. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say Ding's got forty three minutes. How? I mean, it makes sense to invest it now, right? Where there's actually something to calculate. Uh, he's played very quickly. 17 moves to the time control. 
uh, for him. Yeah, some ten, um, ten minutes. So a ten minutes thought is uh, very appropriate here, I guess. Especially as Knight X A three is the opportunity to you know unsettle the game and get something tactical going. Definitely tempting there. Um, and uh, but you do have to calculate the consequence. So of Knight A three, what are the uh, what are the possible options other than E four? Is it really E four the only move to somehow make sense of it? Yeah, it makes sense. The knight takes. We were struggling for options other than uh, oh. Anya's e4 there. Maybe knight e6 and e4, but I don't know if that makes sense, you know, considering mm -hmm. that the immediate e4 exists. Yeah, we are always in this kind of moments. We are kind of hoping that Ding will make his move so that we will be, uh, you know, that we will we'll see in which direction the game goes because it's, these are two <laughs> fundamentally different directions. If either knight mm -hmm. a3 or it's not knight a3. And, uh, but I do think that Dink will uh, take a moment here. He will take a mm -hmm. moment. Maybe we can uh, make some moves on the on the analysis board and uh, try to deep dive into this uh, three possibility Ooh. here. Sorry. Well, I think mm -hmm. we're actually going to go perhaps on a short break first um, and, and kind of let Dink ponder it. And when we come back, we will hopefully have some clarity on which direction the game goes if Dink continues to think. We can dive into Knight Takes A3. Something tells me that he will play Knight Takes A3. But uh, we are going to refill our coffee cups. Folks, you're watching the FIDE World Championship 2023. We'll be back with more Ding versus Nepo in just a couple of short minutes. up to a lot of my friends that are looking for different things wine tasting movies book club meet a lot of new people a lot of new friends and it will make you more social mike klein for chess.com here in astana kazakhstan where they're experimenting with a new technology these three crossing signals are wired to the DGT boards, for example, this means white is winning. And then, uh-oh, a slightly imperfect move. Now it's not so clear. Uh-oh, what's going to happen? Oh, huge blunder by white. So you can actually track the games while walking around the city. We'll see how this goes.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the 2023 FIDE World Championship between Nepo and Ding Liran. World Quant is an official partner of the Chess.com broadcast of the FIDE World Championship. They are a global firm that builds complex mathematical models to identify market inefficiencies. Now, World Quant Brain is bringing together its international quant championship and the chess community to hunt down the next generation of quant finance specialists because nobody knows how to analyze a position better than a chess player, right? If you think you have what it takes, register for the International Quant Championship, head to go.chess.com slash IQC, or use exclam IQC in chat. International Quant Championship, keep it in mind. And we hope you're keeping round three of the World Championship match in mind. Grandmaster David Hal, Grandmaster Anish Giri, and GM Daniel Narodisky bringing you coverage of this fascinating game as Ding tries to make his way out of a one-point deficit. And we've got a couple of moves. Anish, I'll start with you. I'll let you guide us through the last uh, three moves. Well, apparently, uh, uh, David, Ding, just like me, was unaware of the fact that knights on the rim are dim. Uh, so he, or or, or Jan actually was unaware. He plays the knight on a4. And... Uh, well, the advantage it had is that it kicks away Black's Queen from a very juicy position, and it also removed the Knight from a very shaky position on c3. So after Queen e7, which was natural, uh, Jan played rook e1, and now Ding has played Queen f6. Interesting, the Queen is sort of making a round. I'm not sure about the last move of Queen f6. I think there were a lot of options. I don't know why it came so quickly, but I guess he also has not assumed too much time. He has to watch his clock a little bit. After, instead of Queen f6, uh, there are many interesting uh, alternatives there, I believe. Mm -hmm. Which ones caught your eye? Anish, uh, Queen of Six looks very natural to me. Gets off the uh, E-file now that the White Rook is sitting there. Uh, putting some pressure on D4, I guess. Uh, some tactics potentially against B2 long term. Uh, well, there, there was something option. more concrete. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm i not sure if it's good, but it was an option of Queen E8 uh, attacking at the Knight. And then I might try to win a Pawn. Mm -hmm. Not sure if it's good, of course, because I'm somewhat uncoordinated here. But after knight c3, I have knight a3, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm always obsessed with this knight a3 idea. Like a little child, you know, sees a <laughs> cheap, cheap tactic. I cannot get it out of my head. Maybe knight f5 now is a little bit more effective yeah. than it used to be. Uh, it looks very nice for white. And the black pieces are not too active. So queen f6, uh, very natural. Very natural. Queen is much better placed on f6 than it is on e8, of course, guarding this f5 square, also eyeing the b2 pawn. Probably a decent decision. Already a move. Wow. Maybe five, Might... David. Yeah. This is counterintuitive, so I'm surprised he played it so quickly. Of course, Jan, very quick player, but um, yeah, these knights, they look clumsy to me. <laughs> I've got to admit, they're both <laughs> kind of on outposts, but what are they doing? I need uh, to stop laughing because game. they're making me laugh. <laughs> I'm sorry, why, why are you laughing? I mean, no, I, I'm laughing because you're laughing. I was. I, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, no, David's laughing. <laughs> I was laughing. No, but uh, okay. Speaking of the knights, uh, I do like them. Uh, I do like them a lot. Uh, interestingly, they both walked out of uh, being. You know, they they sort of moved away from being attacked, so that they've and they're very comfortable now on these two squares as the black queen has transitioned. Uh, from c5 to f6, the knights are kind of un somewhat untouchable there. And uh, they are looking out for each other, you know. The knight on b5 prevents the move b5, which would hit the a4 knight. They're looking out for each other. And I don't know, I think as long as there's nothing concrete, mm -hmm. white should be doing okay. White should be doing okay here. Um, I liked for black this b5, a4 kind of ideas to try to uh, grab some space on the queen side, but now that's out of the question. Still not sure about queen f6. After all, not sure if that was uh, that was such a good, good square. Maybe a move like knight c7 comes to mind, trying to trade away the b5 knight so that later you can push b5 and uh, gain some space on the queen side. After all, fight for this b5 square, maybe knight c7. Doesn't feel too ambitious. I guess white has multiple ways of equalizing there. Um, maybe some even some takes and. Uh, Knight mm. c3 or some all kinds of ideas, not too um, not too thrilling. I don't know what are, what other moves come to mind, David. Uh, maybe oh maybe h5 h4 also some some idea to 
not sure if h5 h4 is actually anything i can just play h3 and prevent any counterplay right but it's okay mm -hmm. trying to generate something on the king side perhaps yeah i'm also wondering if white at some point can an start annoying harassing those black rooks kind of kicking them away from good squares with like knight to a7 on the topic of knights on the rim being dim uh knight to a7 so in certain situations might uh might be a bit annoying um yeah i'm trying to look for logical moves for black and it's not intuitive mm. to me i was also looking at exchanging one of these knights either knight c5 or knight c7 uh, just trying to get rid of one set but again it feels odd uh, kind of logically to trade off a really nicely centralized knight for one of these two on the side of the board but how to improve i kind of want to centralize my queen but again is it necessarily that good there it just feels like a random move that i'd make in a mm. time scramble or in blitz uh if you if you lack an any yeah, if you, sorry, if you like any ideas, uh, you can always try to improve your position with moves like g6, king, g7. I mean, that's a go-to go to waiting mm -hmm. move. But uh, I would think that um, if uh, that's the best you have at this point, then probably you don't have too much pressure. And white's next moves, I mean, do you want to bring one of the knights back with knight ac3? Or you want to double with rook d3, rook ed1? One of these two, I guess? Mm -hmm. Something to do with the d5 pawn, right? Putting it under pressure. Yeah, I my queen g6 caught my eye for some reason, but I can't fully flesh out why. Maybe to stop rook You're looking for cheapo. Yes, I am. And you're spotting, you're spotting this cheaper potential that you already see a future where yep. knight b2, rook, rook on b2, c2. c2. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a threat. Yeah, yep. yeah, but but you usually how you uh, how you guys you know you dirty people who are always uh, tricking me. Uh, you guys set up these tricks, you know, moves in advance, and you know that one day I will blunder knight b2. So you're setting it up in advance. I appreciate that. Very, very, uh, very clever, cunning idea. You Pretty know interesting me stuff, than myself. <laughs> <laughs> it makes some sense as well. Knight e5, yeah, knight d3 coming in. Mm -hmm. It's like multi purpose. Why not at least float the idea, kind of put the fear of ghosts into the opponent? Exactly. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, at Blitz, it would be very effective at Classical. Um, maybe less so, but we'll see. Uh, if there's nothing else to do, then why not Queen G6, to be honest? Um, well, knight, knight all struggling to come up. Is a problem. Mm -hmm. Knight AC3 yeah. and pressure on this pawn. Yeah, and Daniel spotted 95, mm. 97 cheap as well. Yeah. So we are. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it works both ways. The tactic. It can work both ways, uh, so you're yeah, not sure. Queen g6, indeed. Uh, knight ac3 might, in general, be a, an idea for white mm -hmm. for the next on next move. So the, interestingly, white's managed to rearrange the knights. Uh, so I think yeah, knight, I don't know. Knight c7 is kind of a kind of a principle the move, uh, if you ask me. But maybe it's my wrong instinct to try and clarify position. But I, I kind of like this knight c3. Uh, I do like to to fight for that b5 square. And my idea would then be to trade the knight and get this b5 on down the board and mm -hmm. reinforce my c4 knight. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So uh, big decision right now for Ding. I doubt he would have expected this knight b5 move. Uh, and if I played it very quickly, can uh, and Ding I'm stand the tension? Yeah, an unpleasant surprise probably because it does look pretty good and harmonious, this knight b5 move. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was on his side ding with the clock kind of consumption there. Uh, he still has nearly half an hour, but suddenly it could start to play a factor for the first real time in this game. Uh, we're not yet at move 30. Uh, some big decisions ahead. And this position still shows no signs of uh, fizzling out or no. uh, getting clarified. Well, there are some Would ghosts, it... of course, some ghosts of, uh, of clarification hmm. after if you imagine somewhere knight c3, knight a3, some knight d5, all this. Uh, there, There is knight takes c7, let's say, rook knight, knight c3. There is some potential uh, to see trades here. Let's say, uh, how, do I, how do I start? I don't think knight b2 or knight a3 works because of knight d5, so I have to actually protect d5 first. Yeah, just to show protect, that. Protect d5 first. Do I do it with... Uh, rook cd7 or queen e5, or maybe rook cd7, yeah, let's say. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it is possible that there will be some uh, simplification down the road, or also, of course, it's a pity to have removed the rook from uh, from the c file. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't sure if, yeah, maybe rook d4. 
But here, this looks actually very comfortable for you. So I, I should keep the rook on the C file to keep knight a3 threat alive. Maybe queen e5, queen e5 perhaps. Mm -hmm. A little bit more. Mm. Oh, some I missed something there. Yeah? But isn't there or, maybe e4? Or, yeah. And knight e5. Or oh, yeah, 4 and 95. 4 and 95. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe f4 first as well, because after e4, maybe there is 9b2 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that would be the sort of scenario where we do simplify a bunch of uh, a bunch of pieces. So, yeah, I think a critical decision there for Dink. Knight, knight c7 uh, is, uh, is kind of a way to, to clarify things. But so far, he's been keeping tension co continuously. His every decision, he's been keeping tension. So knight c7 would not be in the, in the spirit. Perhaps uh, he's looking more at moves like h5, g6, the simple moves trying to slightly improve the position. Knight c7 and... on the board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just as you called, Anish. But that final position after the knight trade and just retreating, it did look quite promising to white, at least to me. It just felt like white's got stability now. This black knight still looks nice and pretty, but big weakness to target. Um, how kind of fine is the margin for error here? Um, so we already saw a couple of moves that didn't look good. 92? So 95? Wow. <clears throat> Tactics. Tic Tacs and Oh my god. Oh yeah. What did I blunder, Daniel? Tell me. Is it queen g3, queen takes g3, knight f6? <laughs> no, it's not. Because queen g3, rook d5, rook d5, and c7 hangs. <laughs> Okay, I'm proud. Okay, Whoa. this is a. I'm proud to blunder that. That that that's not a shameful one. I'm proud. I'm proud. Yeah, this is a good blunder. No, I'm. You bring out the best in me, Anish. No, no, this is a respectable. <laughs> it's one of those blunders that I'm like, okay, you got me there. I give we, you that. We should show the um, other line though with Queen G3, because <laughs> that's a, no, a nice one. Knight sick, uh, cheapo. Sick cheapo. It's a, by the way, it's so sick that you could actually blunder it in a real game. Maybe not classical. Mm. Probably more rapid or blitz. I could honestly, I could see myself blunder it. Like I honestly didn't see what was wrong with knight b2 with queen e5. So that's a good one. It's a very deep. Uh, this is typical. Queen g3 takes knight f6. This intermezzo is a typical kind of thing that uh, even a reasonable player can uh, can blunder. Watch this happen wow. in the game. <laughs> yeah. That would be insane. <laughs> a bit insane, but could happen. Commentator's curse strikes again. You're like his hype man, Daniel. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Anish is like the hype man. You set him up, and then Daniel hits with the tactic. It's, uh, it's easy with the eval bar. <laughs> Maybe I could go queen g5, not to, to lose after knight d5? Or is it already too late? <clears throat> Ooh, the eval bar says it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that, that, super that, complicated. My queen no, I can just see it doesn't hit the queen anymore. Mm. So I was not mm. too much off. So knight b2 actually is possible, yeah? It's just my follow up was bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, this, this, yes. Yeah. What well, is it? King has enough. After queen b2, uh, which is that the final one after queen b2, rook d5, okay. or is black actually slightly better? Wow, queen takes. I yeah, it's slightly better, of course, but it must be so drawish. But well, e3 pawn is soft outside past pawn, mm. potentially, maybe. Mm -hmm. Some take, take a4, perhaps. Very little, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, very drawish. This stuff. But against Magnus, I'd be changing my pants right about now. I mean, <laughs> if I had this with White against <laughs> Carlson, I mean, I would, I would not be sleeping peacefully. Yeah, just resign and go home here. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know how this is gonna end. It's some seventy-five <laughs> move. You know, win with a zero on this cross table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But meanwhile, uh, this long variation. Perhaps both players are calculating, right? Um, Jan. It's quite forcing. He's going to be looking at knight takes and knight c3. What could be more natural? Like I have all those cheapos. <laughs> I a joke with my uh, with one of my fr friends because there is the saying wrong long variation, wrong variation. You know the old saying. Mm -hmm. I think Larson maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know that nowadays with the computers, long variation not at all wrong. Yeah, it's a long variation, it's right variation usually. Yeah, so it's uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean it doesn't have to be wrong in this case, and maybe that line we showed is uh, quite relevant, uh, in fact. But knight c3 yeah. was uh, not necessary. We blundered. I mean, not blundered. We of course didn't see knight b2 at first. So after knight c7, rook c7, you could probably make a move first, and then after uh, on the next move, go knight c3. So let's say take take maybe rook d4 or something like that, and b5 knight c3. Mm -hmm. Just post up on a nice outpost, and uh, the, yeah, the tactics might work in White's favor a bit later on. Yeah, I guess that long variation, wrong variation, it's more practical. It's like don't spend your time 
kind of calculating 20 moves into the future when you might make a slip up on the first move or two as we did in that variation yeah of uh, course no but it's it's like you know so many of these sayings they first of all contradict each other uh <laughs> very often also not only in chess but in life you for you for every situation you have uh two different sayings one that advises you one thing and the other that advises you the the other and the same with chess wisdoms like there's usually uh it has to be like applied very selectively so all this uh smart uh smart wisdom and smart sayings is all just uh yeah all relative um but that said we are slowly you know the longer the players think the more the uh, harsher will be the time scramble uh potentially so we are delaying, you know, delaying the excitement, but sooner or later uh, they will deliver some excitement. So uh, to tell our viewers not to worry, we are a little bit bored right now, but soon we will get things will get heated. Yeah, it definitely feels like we're building up to something. And uh, we saw Ding uh, leave the board there. He's been sitting mostly at the board, as we mentioned. How about Yan? Does it look like he's in calculation mode? Uh, Anishi must have sat opposite him countless times. What's he trying to figure out right now? Yes, of course. Yeah, Jan is uh, definitely in his calculation mode. He has uh, missed Knight takes the seven earlier on in the game. Let's just briefly point out that moment once again, the moment where things got slightly out of control. So after bishop d7, an assuming move, uh, he could have played uh, knight to d4. Mm -hmm. I'll move uh, 21 here, I'll show in the... Um, analysis board later on but uh now uh, uh now already that uh yeah uh now that we are here he is uh, completely focused he understands it's a three result game he could also he could also get into some trouble so he's trying to be very accurate he has his thinking cap on and uh, look uh, again is his posture with his hand uh, wrapped around his uh, forehead uh he, he is definitely uh, focused and doesn't want doesn't want to let his lead Slip away so quickly after having obtained it. So yes, yeah, definitely a focused Tian there. Thinking about all the stuff we are looking at, this knight b2, knight d5. I think at some point he might spot queen e5, queen g3, get very excited about it. Then we'll spot queen g5. So all the things we were looking mm -hmm. at, all that <laughs> come into play at some point in his head. Yeah, yeah. he's uh, perf perfected the Gelfand uh, piece well. Uh... <laughs> Don't compare what, what he's doing with the piece to, to what uh, Boris is, the art of Boris. But <laughs> Boris does it very differently. Jan is twirling the piece the way I can also twirl it with uh, almost all of his fingers. What Boris does, he holds the piece with two fingers, between the two fingers, and he throws, flicks it, and it kind of makes... A, it, mm -hmm. it's, the piece is a constant free fall. It's a very different art, what Boris Gelfand is doing to how uh, Jan is twirling uh, the pawn. I, I wouldn't compare him to the art of the, you know, of the, of the piece, um, the art of that Boris, uh, uh, Boris, does. Boris is also able to uh, throw a queen around, which is a very huge, big piece, which is really difficult because playing with the pawn is easy. It's very small. Jan is showing now that he can also play with his bishop. That's, uh, that is also commendable. But Jan, try, try grab that queen. That, that is a real challenge. <laughs> yeah, oh. mesmerizing. Isn't it? Yeah. And uh, how about an inner mono monologue? Because when I play these days, I'm always thinking to myself, okay, do I really try and press here? Do I spend 10 minutes calculating? There's often a lot of kind of uh, arguing with myself about decisions. Is he just purely calculating here? How do you guys do it when you're uh, sitting at the board in these situations, especially really tense uh, with mm. the clock ticking? Well, I, well I, I, go ahead, Anish. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. oh. Go ahead first, yeah, because uh, I am like sometimes I am mm -hmm. even thinking about things outside the chessboard, uh, so I'm not the right <laughs> person to speak about. But I want to, I want to hear, Daniel, what is the chess.com um, <laughs> leaderboard, leaderboard number one? How does what is the thinking process of uh, of leaderboard number one of chess.com? Please enlighten us. <laughs> well, the only minor insight I had is uh, there are situations when you miss what I would call a minor move, like knight takes d7, right? It's not a flat out blunder. But it always puts me on alert. When I like mi completely miss a recapture or I just assumed it was impossible, that already signals to me that I'm probably not in the best calculation of form. And I think almost subconsciously, when a moment like that happens, even if it doesn't objectively impact the evaluation, it definitely makes me second guess subsequent calculations. And 
oftentimes I would err on the side of caution uh, when I'm performing subsequent calculations. So Nepo Miss Knight takes D7. Now the things have gotten very complicated. Maybe he's investing some thought into like Knight C7, Rook C7. Okay, maybe avoiding Knight C3, maybe avoiding the most complicated of the lines. So, you know, maybe he's operating with a little bit more caution. Uh, at least that's kind of what I tend to do when I miss uh, even, even a relatively uh, minor move. But back to you, Anish. Uh, the yeah, actual certainly, professional player. Makes sense. <laughs> Makes sense. You know, uh, I would even add to that, besides these little blunders that are not blunders, what happens a lot is, uh, I guess it happens to everybody, the, sometimes you blunder in your calculation. So you are about, you, you sort of concluded something, and let's say you want, you are about to play knight takes b2, knight d5, queen d5, and then you realize that you've almost blundered queen g3. And just blundering inside your calculation could also definitely cause that, uh, that same lack of confidence and use double guessing, second guessing yourself. Meanwhile, Jan has played, um, has made the move. He goes knight d4. Well, he's of course inviting a move. Oh, wow! Oh, oh. Is that really? Ah, maybe, maybe Ding is not ambitious at all about this position any longer. Maybe. Mm. But even if he's not intending to repeat moves, uh, we should mention to the audience this is uh, the second time we've seen this position. Now the knight's just doing a bit of a dance. Even if Ding isn't intending on going for the draw, it makes sense, right? Just to scope out his opponent's uh, mindset. To at least gain, well, not gain time, on but get quicker, uh, get closer to move forty. So it makes sense from a lot of angles. Uh, yeah, that's why he played it instantly as well. He, if he does the second time instantly, that would be weird. But of course, the first time he does it is instant because with this move he gains time, and not only he gets as one who has less time on the clock. Of course, normally the person wants to get to the time control earlier, and uh, he played instantly trying to gain this extra minutes. Jan is away from the board. And he will Ding will really think twice whether he wants to make a draw or not, but not just now on the next uh, on the next uh, move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Only if White plays Knight B five, maybe then he'll play Knight C seven anyway. But uh, he has options, of course. It's not forced. Yeah, I, I think he will. I think he will want to play for a win after Knight D four, uh, probably rather than after Knight uh, Knight B five. So he will play Knight C seven, Knight D four, and now uh, and then think, and that in that jun juncture. I feel like he'll think and then go 96. <laughs> he'll like <laughs> take three, four minutes. That's what I used to do. And I didn't want my coach to accuse me of taking a draw too soon. I would basically spend the rest of my time. Well, like, listen, I was in, I was in time pressure anyway. Of course I had to take the draw. Uh, you uh, know, but... it's very, very common. It happens a lot. So you have like people, they have like 40 minutes against 30 minutes, let's say. And they are in this situation. And then they drop to like 20 minutes. And they're like, yeah, you know, I had less time, so I decided to. Uh, yep. To, uh, <laughs> exactly. You only have less time because you spent all your time on the last on this move. Come on. It's yeah. a, but it's a common uh, Oach, trick. Yeah, I think they've done that. Yes. Which doesn't have to know that. <laughs> he doesn't have to know when you spent that time. Coach watching. Coach watching. <laughs> and knight b5 immediately from Jan. Um, we, I guess, we're assuming now that he's happy with the draw with White. He should be. He should be. Uh, I think after he missed knight uh, takes d7, he already definitely realized that uh, this game he has to play it safe, and uh, there's no reason not to because he's still leading. So the draw is completely fine for him. And uh, it's if anyone is ding that has to always second guess these kind of decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, the clock could play a factor. Ding is ten minutes lower than his opponent. Uh, should we make some predictions? Is this going? Uh, is this going to continue, or will we see Ding bail out and tell his coach that he was lower on the clock? <laughs> well, I predict the draw. Yeah. So draw. Daniel, go ahead. Draw. Uh, I draw. think draw. Yeah, I think draw because it's it's not the sort of like we didn't even identify a specific alternative that just seems to you know get anything maybe, going. I mean, ninety seven, ninety four. The only tempting move that you consider if you want to play for a win. I think B5. it's the move B5, because that's, mm -hmm. that's uh, kind of pretty. Uh, you sort of um, re reconnect the pawns with, with, with each other. But I really don't think that it looks better for uh, for black by no means. Knight C5 or Knight C3, it looks maybe balanced, sort of. But I don't see this as a reason to play on with the less time on the clock. Even Knight C5, let's say. Yeah, Knight C5, Knight D3. Like, I mean, winning this position is a very, 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 very long way to go. Uh, with less time on the clock, Ding not still not very confident, and the temptation to end this game, end it uh, mm -hmm. in a reasonable way, and then to press uh, for a win with the white pieces after having recovered from a loss. I think Ding is likely to repeat moves here. 
I'll be surprised if he plays for a win. But 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 I would uh, respect that very much, and I would I would think that's 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 great. But I wouldn't expect. It. Yeah, and uh, you said you'd respect it a lot. Maybe he wants to make uh, Jan respect it, <laughs> respect him for uh, at least showing courage here and playing on. I don't know how much risk is involved there. Anish, the variation you showed, for example, uh, is Black really risking that much after a move like B5? Yes, White can move the knight. Feels like Black has full stability anyway. Um, okay, body yeah, language wise, you know, though. You know how it is. I yeah, mean, of course, I you don't head to side side. <laughs> You don't mm, risk yep. just now, but uh, if uh, the game uh, goes on and you have less time, um, you know things things can definitely spiral out of control at some point. Mm -hmm. So, Wait. well, we, we'll see on the next move up to knight d4. Is knight d4 threefold? Because the, it, it, isn't the position reached three times after knight d4, or am I mistaken? I don't think the knight was on c7. The, the mm -hmm. first. The time. first time the knight was on d4, the black knight was on e6, the black queen was on oh, e7. Oh, right. Okay, got it. Got it. Got it. Not yet. No, no. But so, after knight d4, then up to Dink. He can claim a draw or he can play b5. I think that, that is the critical point. Yeah, because indeed b5 indeed is also reasonably stable. I don't like the knight on c7. It's a, such a passive knight. It's defending, uh, defending the pawns, but it's a, such a passive square. From c7, the knight can only jump to e6 from where it can then jump to c5 and then uh, enter white's camp. So you are really far away from creating any threats. It's hard for me to somehow uh, imagine that Ding will play for a win with a knight on c7. Like, I mean, you can go b5, but I don't know. I, I don't expect that. And knight d4 is on the board. And now the moment of truth. Will Ding claim the draw with knight e6? That is threefold. He's looking at a score sheet. That's usually a pretty, pretty much a giveaway. It's yeah. a draw, and that is threefold repetition. Mm -hmm. And the handshake and... is coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, they got to claim it. Yep. Because uh, until move forty, you cannot accept a draw, so you have to claim the three or fold. But the arbiter is sharp; it's right there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Did you yeah. handshake? Standard procedure would have been to stop the clock right down the move uh, and call the arbiter. But uh, yeah, either way, it was going to be a draw. And what do we think? A fair result? A tense game? Yeah, I think a wire to wire equal game. I think an important game for Ding to prove to himself that he can basically draw without going through a worse position. He was in control of this game. Maybe on move 17, we'll take a look at look at it b5 was more ambitious than c5 but anish i think definitely all things held equal a confidence boost a solid drop from a position of strength of the black pieces yeah for sure for sure as a you know thinking from a perspective of a ding fan if i was one uh, i definitely would fear a uh, knockdown so another loss and uh, two losses in a row would be would be disaster i really like also from i like from the start just the way ding looks today even now, he sits there, you know, with his arms on the table, and uh, he's talking, he's smiling a bit. I just like how he looks. I think he, I think that loss it uh, relieved the pressure uh, in some sense, and I think he's got plenty of time to come back. You know, we just started. We have so many rounds ahead, more than ten rounds. I think eleven rounds ahead of us, and uh, lots of opportunities to bounce back. And we saw, you know, good play from Ding today. We also. So an interesting opening choice. I think we will see this again. I think Jan will see this as an opportunity to get a playable position with White. So I think we will see a repeat of this at some point, maybe in the next White game by Jan. And a lot more, a lot more interesting games I had in uh, the Nimso or the Carlsbad structure. So some information there also gained by Jan and by uh, by Ding as well. Uh, a quiet day, but definitely some interesting takeaways from it. What do you guys think? Yeah, maybe we can pinpoint a couple of uh, key moments from the game because there were some uh, big decisions made. You mentioned the opening, Anish, the first one. Uh, the Queen's Gambit declined. Big information there. Uh, Jan, he's played 1e4, he's played 1d4. He knows what his opponent's repertoire is going to be uh, for the tournament. And uh, if we whiz ahead, it was perhaps uh, a bit later on. You mentioned that Jan was maybe caught by surprise. Uh, they were following your game, Anish. And uh, it was only later on here after the bishop trade, after a bit of maneuvering, uh, where we thought perhaps Ding could have uh, improved, could have even struck with b5, uh, with white under pressure. First key moment of the game? 
Yeah, definitely. I think also the first key moment, uh, there was probably one before where Giannis decided to uh, follow, you know, my wrong footsteps, gaining nothing out of the opening. Um, but certainly, yes, an important moment here, B5 or C5. Uh, but uh, still lots of interesting things happened later as well after C5. I think this bishop takes the 7, 9 to 7, yeah, was a small little uh, potential little turnaround there where Ding got some chances to go for the initiative. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, uh, to that, I think uh, Janus played it reasonable, uh, reasonably uh, uh, well and uh, didn't look like Ding had something uh, clear at any point. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a small slip here. Bishop takes d7. We mentioned knight to d4. White would have been able to play on with zero risk at all. But uh, yeah, ding. I think maybe the most impressive move of the whole game for me, at least, was knight takes d7, just having that on the radar, um, doing a little bit of calculation, realizing that that was the piece that needed to be improved. And um, yeah, likewise uh, for Jan, the impressive move for me was here. It felt like White was under serious pressure. Uh, we went to a break at this point thinking, okay, Black is uh, doing the business, maybe some tricks with uh, knight takes b2, knight takes a3. And uh, yeah, commentator's curse. I said no knights on the rim, mm -hmm. knight to a4. Really nice defensive move, kicking the black queen, uh, maybe in the wrong direction. And um, yeah, it was here that we started repeating knight b5, equally impressive, got to say. Just, uh, yeah, just yeah, holding I mean, on some key squares. We take so much of this for granted when these moments when one side is tiny bit worse and then just finds two or three accurate moves and makes the draw that's what we're you so used to from these top players and that is an incredible skill so kudos to jan holding his composure and just uh you know hammering out a couple of accurate moves meat and potatoes kind of game but you know jan's happy he's up a point yeah yes Who indeed and oh, just, sorry. just to uh, Reinforce what you said about knight a4. You know, we've got this rule of uh, no knights on the edge of the board, but sometimes you got to break the rules, and a top player like Jan, he knows when to do so, and it's that's quite impressive. Indeed. And we're looking at the scoreboard here. Game three has concluded, ladies and gentlemen. There are two draws. Game one was a draw. Game two was a victory, the only victory of the match, a black victory for Jan Nepomnishi. That is why he has a one-point lead as he leads the match two points to one. And tomorrow he will have the black pieces in game four. David, I mean, he has won with the black pieces. That's not to say that Jan is eagerly awaiting the game with the black pieces. I am eagerly awaiting uh, what Ding will bring to the table. Will we see H3 again? Somehow, I don't think so. What about you, David? Yeah, I can guarantee, Daniel, that we won't see H3 again. Um, Ding not only lost with White uh, in game two of this match, he also lost with White against Jan in the candidates. So there is a bit of a mental block. Um, but either way, I think Ding should be very happy with the way he played today. Uh, survived a black with no problems, as uh, as you mentioned there. And if he switches it up, even if he gets a playable position out of the opening with White, if he's not struggling from an early stage like he was in game two, then I think great chances. Um, he will want to strike on the next uh, in the next game. And yeah, Jan still ahead in the match, but a long, long way to go. Yeah, I agree. And certainly, you know, the fact that uh, he lost with White, that's of course a pity, but that said, still, the White pieces are the ones where you try to strike in a match this long. And um, that is the positive uh, for Ding going into the next game. But the negative is that, you know, he's played H3 in the previous game. That was maybe, it, was that the best, you know, the best he had, his best weapon? Um, if that is the case, then maybe he doesn't have any um, great weapons in store ready for Jan. So I'm a little worried uh, from that sense because, okay, H3 is interesting, it's nice, but it's only one H3. For A3, Jan will already be ready. And now my question is, does Ding have something interesting uh, against Jan's main repair? Or does he have some interesting idea in the uh, Tarash that Jan plays, maybe in the uh, uh, Catalan somewhere? Uh, because if he doesn't, then it will be difficult because Jan, who is playing so well, uh, in such a good shape today also demonstrated good form in the end you know playing accurately in slightly lost position you're not going to beat him empty-handed you need to have a weapon and whether dink has a weapon i'm not sure we will we're about to find out we are indeed we will find out to be exact tomorrow as we look at the schedule uh, the game four starts at the same time 2 a.m pacific 5 a.m eastern and 11 p.m more civilized hour in a uh, Central European Standard Time. Then, of course, there are no more than two days without a rest day. So, Friday will be a rest day, followed by games 
over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. All games start at the same time at 2 a.m. tomorrow. Nepo, as we're discussing, will have the black pieces. And on that note, folks, it has come time for us to start wrapping up. Um, David, Anish, I'd like uh, for you to share your final thoughts on uh, what we saw today, the shortest game of the match thus far. David, I'll start with you, your kind of immediate conclusions. Uh, firstly, I want to say sorry for jinxing it. I've joined you and it was a quick draw or <laughs> at least a short draw. But uh, yeah, my conclusions are that Ding is back. I loved seeing him at the board. I think that's the main takeaway. He looked focused. He played well. And I think promising signs for a uh, hard fought match to come. I was worried coming into today that Ding wouldn't recover, but the rest aid did him good. And uh, yeah, I'm optimistic that the rest of the match will be exciting. Anish, Ding is back. Do you agree with that assertion? Did the game today convince you that Ding is in a better state than he was after the loss? Yeah, I think you could say Ding is back. I wouldn't uh, write it with the capitals like Ding is back and like many exclamation marks. It's not this kind of Ding is back. It's like Ding is back, you know, with a small regular font size. Ding is back. But whether you know Ding is back, that is what the fans are waiting. And I think we are mm -hmm. we might find out in the next game because then he's got a white pieces that's where not only he might get objective opportunities but also the game the white pieces was where your mindset is different so if heading into today he probably didn't want to do anything uh, wild he was happy with the draw but going into the next game he of course wants to come back so he's got the spirit he's got the mindset and if he's also got some opening weapon i think there are chances he will actually be back and uh, of course we we want uh, this match to be exciting we want it to be close and uh, ding coming back would be huge news for this whole championship. It would indeed. Tomorrow is a huge game, folks. Ding will have the white pieces, another chance to prove himself. And on that note, I'd like to thank uh, my fellow commentators, Grandmaster Anish Giri, Grandmaster David Howell. A great pleasure to commentate with you. Um, of course, to our entire amazing chess.com crew uh, for another flawless production. And of course, to everybody in the chat, I think we had something like 30,000 on Twitch alone. We have now hit over a million followers on Twitch. So a massive shout out to those of you who take time out of your day to watch our coverage and participate in the chat. Uh, you make this uh, a magical experience. And on that note, folks, you have been watching the 2023 FIDE World Championship. We will be back with game four tomorrow, bright and early. But for now, have a great rest of your day. This was Grandmaster Daniel Nerdiski, Grandmaster Anish Giri, and Grandmaster David Howell saying goodbye from the FIDE World Championship. We'll see you tomorrow.
Thank you. 